Uh, yeah, thank you, Beth. Okay, um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker for the symposium, um, who is Dr. Alexandra Kerman. Um, Dr. Kerman is a senior lecturer in French and Francophone studies at the University of Macquarie in Australia. And um, Dr. Kerman is also a specialist of Vietnamese diaspora literature, uh, particularly uh, the works of Linda Le. Um, and in 2016, she published a monograph titled Intertextual Weaving in the Works of Linda Le, Imagining the Ideal Reader. Um, and uh, Dr. Kerman also works more broadly on refugee, migrant and exile writing in French, um, which links to what she'll be speaking to us about this morning. Um, and the title of today's presentation is um, The Immersion, uh, so, sorry, Immersion in Literature as Other, the Sartrean Gaze and the Production of Empathetic Reader Consciousness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. Thank you very much to the organizers as well for inviting me to give this address. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. I might firstly, before I start, like to acknowledge that I'm speaking uh, from the unceded land of the Daramurugal people in the Darug Nation, um, whose elders past and present have protected and cared for the, these salt water lands. And I extend my welcome to all First Nations people present here, or perhaps really watching the recording later. So this research, um, it's still quite nascent, it's a, it's a development project, um, was the result of an attempt to well, offer theoretical backup to like, a personal sentiment I had as a reader, um, in that we kind of become other through, through reading texts um, as our own. So on the intimate relationship between the bibliophile and the object of his desire, uh, Walter Benjamin describes his relationship with books in terms of a relocation. He writes that it is, quote, not that they come alive in him, but rather it is he who lives in them. Benjamin, with many another, reiterates the worldly and experiential quality of the reading process. Taking his lead, if we were to step back momentarily for the sake of taking seriously the anecdotal, we might ask what phenomena could be at play to give the reader the distinctly real impression of dwelling in the textual world when reading a narrative text. While Jean-Paul Sartre wrote prolifically in the genre of philo uh, philosophical literature, I draw from his phenomenological essay on ontology known by its abbreviated title, Being and Nothingness, to apply his analysis of the experience of human existence in the world to that of the reader in the imagined world of the text. In doing so, this discussion takes a phenomenological analysis, makes a phenomenological analysis of the act of fiction reading. Where ontology studies that which exists and the nature of its being, phenomenology is the study of the structures of consciousness in our first person experience of what is in the world. Sartre brings um, these fundamental areas of philosophical consideration into dialogue and being a nothingness by theorizing the experiential relationship of conscious being with worldly phenomena. His proposed existential categories of a self-identifying passive being in itself, um, capable of transcending its situational circumstances, um, characterized by facticity or the realities of our living, uh, in contrast to a conscious dynamic being for itself, positions human e um, existence at the juncture of self-determination and pre-ordinance. The reading act too sits at the intersection of being in itself and consciousness for the already written text is a given that all the same makes use of the reader to interpret forms of being in the narrative. In this vein, we might say that reading creates a second level platform on which to experience existence, since the reader can be seen to live in the text by way of an imagined migration into another subject position in an unknown space, 
both of which appear in real time as and when one reads. Creating a dialogue between Sartrean um, phenomenological ontology and narratological theorization, I argue that reading literature can provide us with transformative encounters of otherness that move beyond vicarious experience. For when we immerse ourselves in the first person fiction narrative, we are afforded the unique opportunity to say I and yet mean another. To Sartre, such an occasion is rendered impossible in the world due to what he calls the look or the holding of another person in one's direct line of sight. Meeting another's gaze creates an inescapable subject object dyad that allows us to occupy only one of two alternating positions to be at any one time either the subject who looks or the object that is seen. Looking being anal analogous to thinking for the subject, the only point of view one can ever hold is this one's own. Yet when we turn our sights from each other to the written word, I argue that we can transcend our own subjectivity to live and see in the text as other. To show how the reader might inhabit or share in the consciousness of the narrating other, I first discuss the mechanism of the look as it's presented by Sartre in terms of uh, the role it plays in the construction of a dialectic division between self and other, and the resulting problems it causes or may cause in interrelational situations. My subsequent transposition of the structure of the look to the act of reading focuses on the particularity of engaging with a first person fictional narrative, which I suggest, given the right circumstances, may subvert Sartre's injunction to knowing the other as they know themselves. Supporting this argument from the perspective of narrative theory leads me to draw equally on Monica Flodenick's experiential model of narratology, as well as on contemporary scholarship on theory of mind. Sartre's notion of a generous reader, proposed in Waters literature, also assists in positing what I call a reader consciousness, which I see as responsible for enhancing empathy in those who engage in fiction reading. So through the recurrent everyday event of Le Regard or the Look, Sartre develops a concept of the fundamental relationship between self and other. He perceives the look between human beings as creating an inescapable yet ceaselessly interchangeable subject object dyad. To Sartre, the other can only exist as an object to us and us as an object to them. This occurs because to hold another in our gaze is to pronounce their existence in the world, um, necessarily positioning us, the seer, as the speaking subject of that enunciation. Indeed, to name the other, we forcibly use proper nouns or pronouns, you, they, she, he, to render the other an object in our sentence making, just as the other, as a conscious being or consciousness, must necessarily do the same to refer to us. As a consequence, we are at all times at risk of losing our subjectivity to an objectifying other and vice versa. We are in constant flux between subject and object positions according to who is held at any one time in the gaze of whom. Such a structure renders our being in relation to others fundamentally confrontational according to Sartre. Referring to the slippage from a subject to object and back again, Sartre writes, I am referred from transfiguration to degradation, from degradation to transfiguration without ever being able to either to get a total view of the ensemble of these two modes of being on the part of the other, for each of them is self-sufficient and refers only to itself, or to hold firmly to either one of them, for each has its own instability and collapses in order for the other to rise from its ruins. Two binds ensue from this inescap inescapable division. It follows firstly that any overriding perspective of our relationship to others must elude us. Secondly, that the other can only ever constitute an object to us and inversely us an object to them means that another person can never know us the way we subjectively know ourselves. And we in turn are forever barred from looking out of the subjective viewpoint of even our nearest and dearest to see the world from their singular perspective. The effect of our unknowability, which is partly responsible for the hell that such a cause other people in La Puy-Clau, infers that others must necessarily build another version of us by which we are known in the world, one with which we are unable to ever become acquainted. Could it ever be re revealed to us in its subjectivity, this image would of course not fit with our personal sense of self. He writes, for the other is not this me of which 
he has an intuition and I do not have the intuition of this me which I am. Thus, when the other describes my character, I do not recognize myself and yet I know that it is me. Yet that such a subject object dichotomy may preclude our knowability to another, um, the inverse may not be true. The imaginative act of reading may contravene the prohibition that renders the other a subject beyond our limit. For we can come to know others as textual beings by inhabiting their narrative consciousness and reading their first person stories as if they were our own. The look while held by someone as a primarily by some as a primarily phenomenological occasion wherein we literally see each other in the world is also read in a symbolic sense as Sartre writes it is never eyes that look at us but rather the mind that beholds to some including Barnes and Dolagel the look has a metaphorical function which makes possible our self-reflexive capacity of consciousness since to see is also to apprehend and to intuit the other's gaze gives rise to our ability to perceive how we think we may appear to another combined with Sartre's primary um, assignation of intersubjectivity to the look it can be better understood as a potential means to comprehend ourselves and others both individually and in relation this encompassing metaphorical meaning is privileged here in the application of the concept to what might, what might be called a second order state of being in the reading of a fiction text. The bi-directional gaze is emblematic of our encounter with other people and at its most simple marks the moment one becomes conscious of the objectification of the self by the other. If someone looks at me, Sartre writes, I am conscious of being an object, but this consciousness can be produced only in and through the existence of the other. Equally, my look upon another confers upon that person their own self-consciousness through the apprehension of the self as the unknown object of unknowable appraisals. That was uh, Sartre I was quoting. When it becomes apparent that there is nothing one can do to either know or influence the appraisal made of oneself, the freedom of the other as subject to make of the world as they wish and our lack of power in this regard is revealed. Together then, both looking and knowing one is looked at, bring about the awareness of our quote, being in the world and our being for others. Sartre famously exemplifies the look in a, what's called a classical phenomenological account of shame in being and nothingness. Often reiterated in scholarship that engages with the look, in this instance, we repeat again what could be dubbed the keyhole scenario to illustrate the double effect of the gaze, its metaphorical implications and uh, the way it produces a triad, triadic ontological structure made up of self, other and consciousness of being. Sartre's illustration of perceiving, so looking at or and apprehending, as in being looked at, knowing one is looked at, involves unabashedly looking through a keyhole to spy on a lover. One then heeds approaching footsteps and experiences a sense of shame. Initially, the viewer is unconscious of the effect of their own gaze upon someone else unawares. As alone, there is no self to inhabit my consciousness, writes Sartre, nothing therefore to which I can refer my acts in order to qualify them. Once the act is thought to be known, however, since no other person actually ever arrives on the scene, the viewer feels shame at having imagined being caught committing a socially shameful act. As Sartre explains in Being in Nothingness, I am suddenly affected in my being. I see myself because I imagine somebody sees me. Now disaffected, since to Sartre the act of being looked at by another um, is analogous to the alienation of self, a third structure of being arises, surplus to the unreflective acting self, so the being in itself, and the perceived um, looking other, um, and that is one's self-consciousness. When the observation of being looked at is transformed into the knowledge of being seen by another, the viewer becomes visible to themselves in that they see themselves as though from a distance, from the outside position of the other looking in. So I'll give you a rather silly um, cartoon here to, to illustrate this. Um, it does it quite well in the, in the last, um, in the very last uh, sequence. 
So the look is therefore what bestows upon us our consciousness of human existence. It follows that if we can figuratively experience the same effects of these ocular events in the text, in the space rather than the place of the narrating eye, the look could also provide the theoretical justification and reasoning for our propensity as readers, after Benjamin, to feel as though we live as conscious beings in the reading of a book. To transpose this triadic structure onto the reading act, we can conceive of this outside self-conscious position as belonging to the reader, while the narrator or unconscious acting self exchanges the look with textual others in the narrative. It could be assumed that the reader located outside of the text might take up the position of the subject who looks at textual entities and um, actions as objects, since this is also in fact uh, what the text is to the reader. Certainly such a position would gain the Sartre and freedom of the subject for the reader and um, any associated judicial power afforded um, the post-structural reader born of the death of the author. Yet in this discussion and here, the reader is not conceived as a destination um, of the text, but as a cognizant actor in the narrative on the level of consciousness. Self-consciousness is thus embodied outside of the text in the shape of the reader during the reading act. When using the term embody, it is not to suggest that the reader gives bodily form to the narrating eye or that the reader stands in the narrator's stead. Rather, I relocate the self-consciousness of the narrator to the extra textual position, a third space of perception that I call reader consciousness. While the narrator reveals self-awareness, of course, through internal dialogue and the narrative, on a second level of consciousness, the reader, who has an ontological subject, who as an ontological subject is capable of both perceiving through the eyes of the first person narrator and apprehending the narrating eye as an object in the eyes of other characters, consistently reacts to narrative events in alignment with the vacillating subject object of the narrator. The emotional reaction of the reader, their sense of personal shame in the case of the keyhole scenario, for example, that we'll try out later, um, or, or inauthentically, um, if they're prideful or fearful, which to Sartre are also indications of the knowledge of objectification, is evidence of an activated reader consciousness connected to the narrating self. That is why I asked argue after Sartre that during the act of reading, quote, we see people who are known for their toughness shed tears at the recital of imaginary misfortunes. To illustrate how this might work, let us read through the keyhole scenario and then reimagine this same scene as a fictional episode told directly in the first person. The Sartre sets the scene for a violation of privacy that the reader of being and nothingness will envision as enacted by another. As an omniscient narrator in being and nothingness, he instructs, quote, let us imagine that moved by jealousy, curiosity or vice, I have glued my ear to the door and looked through a keyhole. So in this instance, the looking other, imagined to be Sartre himself, figures as the third, in the third person singular to the reader as he who relays the action of the eye figure, with Sartre being the storyteller. Instead, for the sake of making a point, let us reread this disclosure from the first person perspective alone, imagining it were recounted in a fiction text by a first person narrator. Moved by jealousy, curiosity or vice, I've just glued my ear to the door and looked through a keyhole, but all of a sudden I hear footsteps in the hall. Someone is looking at me. Arguably, the impetus in the second reading changes from judgment of another to a self-reflective shared emotion that falls somewhere on a shifting scale from shame to fear when we are consciously reading the I, which belongs to another, as if it were our own. In this particular instance, the narrating eye elicits an authentic reaction of shame, which we process on a personal level, allowing for us to have a unique experience that our being in the world ordinarily precludes. That is an encounter with the subjectivity of the, another. Such self-reflexivity um, can only take effect if the reader is inclined to put the self benevolently in the conscious space of the narrator. Indeed, Sartre's own vision of literature binds the author and a quote, generous reader in a pact that demands the latter, the latter give of their quote, whole freedom in the collaborative creation of the text. 
By freedom, Sartre means the free will to choose one's actions and reactions made possible by a being whose conscious awareness of self is orientated towards the future. If we read from within this future-oriented oriented, uh, space of agency, Sartre argues in Waters Literature that we can become aware of the unbounded nature of the freedom of choice for the very reason that the fiction text, according to him, exposes the reader to all that they have not chosen. Quote, for a moment they have become what they would have been if they had not spent their lives hiding their freedom from themselves. So he's talking about the reader. What is critical here is the suggestion that reading offers moments of new experience that require the reader to be aware of two perspectives at the one time, that of the narrating other and that of the self. Having taken on the consciousness of another, the reader gains an awareness of this other's freedom bestowed by the author. Yet for this abundance of freedom to reveal one's own lack thereof, the reader must also remain conscious of oneself in relation to the narrator. Regarding the acknowledgement of this distinction between self and other, Thomas Nagel, in his well-known 1974 philosophical essay, What Is It Like to Be a Bat?, asserts the impossibility of one organism knowing what it is like for another organism to be that very organism, due to the inability to enter into the, quote, subjective character of experience of another being. In other words, to use his example, Nagel holds that we cannot know what it is like for the bat to be a bat as we cannot ever be a bat. Our minds to Nagel are also not up to the compensatory task of clairvoyance, since it requires us to be similar enough to the subject in question to be able to adopt its point of view and then objectively recount this knowledge from one's own station. Or in Nagel's words, quote, to understand the inscription in the first person as well as in the third, so to speak. Could it not be claimed that this is what occurs when a human subject adopts the subjective perspective of another during the reading act and analyzes the first person description from both the first and third person point of view, saying I, and yet also knowingly meaning two separate subjects? Certainly a particular kind of dialogism in the form of a consistent return to the text is required to keep in check a reader consciousness that would retreat into a reliance on processing the other's experience solely from their own subjective perspective. Following such a line of thought, this would also mean to say that the reader and narrator, as opposed to the reader and writer, as Sartre originally proposes, enter into a quote, dialectical coming and going that results in a creative collaboration in the making of the literary text. While the writer is responsible for offering up to the reader those who people the text, it is with the first person protagonist or the narrator that the generous reader collaborates first and foremost. Moving on to the discussion now of narrative theory, narratological theory supports the possibil possibility that one human being can adequately understand the first person description of another by suggesting that textual empathy occurs thanks to the relativization of personal experience. Monica Flodenick's experiential reading paradigm is based on a reader response fr framework that focuses on the realm of storytelling and oral language. Unlike in the structuralist approach that divides narrative into the two spheres of long, so systems of language and grammar and parole, speech acts, a paradigm that has received criticism for not taking account of evolving scholarly discourses such as feminist and post-colonial theory, Flodenick purposefully renders her narrative theory historical by anchoring it in human cognitive experience. Seeing experientiality and narrativity as synonymous concepts, since we create narratives about our lives to understand them, Flodenick concludes that, quote, the goal of narrative is to represent human experience to other humans. Engaging with narrative requires the recognition um, to Flodenick of that experience through what she calls, and in, in inverted commas, natural cognitive parameters, or the knowledge we have of familiar real life situations that we use to understand a given narrative. As for situations that um, do not have a grounding in what is familiar to us, so-called non-natural narratives, Flodenick says the reader draws on relative universal schemata to interpret what is foreign to them in the text. 
Both kinds of interpretation follow an experiential process that she calls emendation, by which she refers to our, quote, enmeshment or engagement with our environment, which operates as a central cognitive frame, mediating our view of the textual world. Ludenick holds that emendation leads to our emotional involvement in the text, be it evaluative or empathetic, and that this approach is what narrativizes the text for each individual reader. Narrativity to Fludenik is therefore, quote, constituted by the quasi-mimetic evocation of real life experience, whereby the reader activates textual understanding by reconceptualizing their own individual and universal human experiences as that, as that which is read, resulting in what she calls the, quote, situational embodiment of a character or narrator. This projection of consciousness, so quote, uh, I quote Friedrich, um, assists the functioning of my former postulation that we inhabit the consciousness of the narrator. Friedrich's version of narrativity provides a framework that explains from a narratological perspective how reader consciousness may operate. Contemporary scholarship in search of new ways to sell the book back to non-practicing readers asserts as part of a quote, social improvement hypothesis that the greatest benefit gained from reading literature is an enhanced propensity for empathy. Studies that measure the capacity for empathy in uh, relation to exposure to fiction, comparing fiction and non-fiction genres, um, confirm a positive correlation to the former. Empathy is related to other social skills that facilitate interconnectedness, which together have become a subject of study known as theory of mind, which is a sophisticated relational ability to both understand and explain how we can comprehend without the need for direct verbal communication, what others think and feel. Narrative theory has come to focus in recent times on theory of mind as new means to analyze reader response to literary texts, in particular relation to the generation of empathy towards unfamiliar peoples. Theorization that employs theory of mind in conjunction with literary criticism seeks to answer for the apparent, quote, imaginary transposition of oneself into the shoes of another in the reading act. Fritz um, Breihaupt's complex model of empathy that is based on the recognition of um, reciprocal observation is most fitting um, in relation to this discussion. His model maps clearly onto the structure of the look. Empathy, by help writes, is possible when the observer registers what the other can see, feel, observe. The observer understands that the other is also an observer. If one was to say the same thing in Sartrean terms, it would read as follows. We are able to understand the world of the other when we realize that the, that the other, rendered an object by our gaze, has the potential to return that gaze to objectify us in their turn. Both Breihaupt's theory and the phenomenology, phenomenology of the look are applicable to narrative as well as to social relations in the world. Equally, both are based upon the dynamic nature of the dyad made up of the observer and the observed. Weihaupt's words surely echo Sartre's when he writes, quote, the observed scene and the observer are linked by means of some spontaneous commonality that arises from the act of observation. We could say the look. Returning to a Sartrean analysis of the reading act, a realization of the capacity of the observed to observe us reveals an awareness of the look of other characters in the narrative on the narrator and reader as one whole entity composed of an extra textual reader consciousness and the narrator. The keyhole scenario in being a nothingness in which it is shown how the reader can feel the shame of the looked at narrator is a primary example of this. To recognize objectification of the self in the textual world in which one dwells establishes the reciprocity of the subject object dyad in their reading act, a reciprocity that translates in theory of mind as an environment ripe for empathy. Since the structure of the look mirrors that of the production of empathy, it could be transposed to a textual context to make possible the production of reader empathy. Turning to Garçon Monkey, I'd like to now look at the application of this theorization. Um, as a subjective personal experience, reading the other as a self doesn't really lend itself very easily to direct proof analysis. Um, so in turn, the proposal I have made today would probably be best tested out using survey methods, I think, at the moment. 
uh, since this is a nascent research project that um, interrogates the reading experience from a theoretical angle, we can instead examine the techniques a writer deploys that might encourage the development of a reader consciousness. To this end, this end I've chosen Nina Bourawi's Garçon Monkey, not only for its superlative use of the pronoun je in reference to an intersectional narrator, but also for its alternating usage of a range of subject pronouns that replicate the processes of Sartre's look in an imaginary world. Garçon Monkey is a first person auto fictional account of a biracial child's upbringing, firstly in post independence Algeria and later in Rennes, France, when the family leaves an environment that is increasingly hostile towards them. The divided cultural linguistic self expectedly becomes a subject of focus in the novel. This French Algerian double identification is then mirrored by the narrator's gender trouble, which leads her to describe herself in terms of prescribed failures as un garçon manqué or une fille ratée. The many faces of the author are known from the book covers of her autofictional works, and in this text, the author transforms herself into multiple autofictional selves. Bourawi creates a succession of others in a prolific illustration of Rambo's often cited description of self as other. Je me déguise souvent, je dénature mon corps, explains the, the narrator. The split self in the novel, Helen Vassallo calls evidence of identity crises as the narrator reinvents herself as masculine doubles and experiences reiterations of her original name in the process of migration. Nina initially replaces her often absent father by creating um, an imaginary masculine self named Brio, Brio uh, whose brazen demeanor gives rise to Ahmed, the name she gives as an androgynous presenting child to adults who attempt to reinstate her gender identity as that of a girl. When the children are moved to Rennes, um, Yasmina, the child's original Arabic name, evolves into Nina, a socially acceptable European iteration for her French family and friends. Finally, the logical translation of Yasmina is also denied her since it is said to be better befit a canine in France, her great maternal grandmother having named her poodle Jas Jasmine. Nina must also, of course, retain her Arabic surname that designates the father she has creatively personified in the past and hence at the author's late profession while reinstating her, her Algeriance, to quote Sixou. The recurrent splitting of the narrating self, which highlights the rupture between self and other in the context of cultural belonging and gender expression, does not divide the I narrator into five separate I figures, since Nina names her other selves in the third person. Splitting does affect an ease of slippage, however, between subject positions that simultaneously makes room for the reader's incorporation into the world of the I figure. Huawei initially deploys the literary device of repetition as a means to coax the reader into a certain complicity with the I figure that will eventuate in the useful conflation of reader and narrator within an inclusive signifier. The ceaseless repetition of the first person pronoun in this early passage in the novel, which I will let you read yourselves, draws the reader into the spatial proximity of the I figure. But her real invitation of the reader into the narrative occurs in the final slip from an eye focused paragraph such as this into an inclusive address that reaches outside of the text. In this case, we see the use of the personal pro, um, first person plural, nous. Often she uses on for the same purposes, both of which gesture towards belonging, enticing the reader, whether mixed or not, to join the narrator. Building on this invitation, an intimate inclusion occurs between the first and second person singular once another alliance has been established. As the novel progresses, the narrator invests in a character that is both complicit with and similar to Nina. Her closest friend, a young boy called Amin, is also born of French Algerian parentage. Her so-called boyish behavior is mirrored in his so-called feminine traits, so that they are understood to both be referenced when Amin's mother expresses fears that her son may be, quote, um, homosexual. Rather than splitting, as seen in the previous reinventions of the self, the narrator enters into the other so that the two beings appear to inhabit one, one subject position, as, in, uh, as we see in uh, Je suis en toi, Amin, tu es pénétré. 
Indeed, I mean from the outset fits orthographically into the name Jasmine, inferring that they have always inhabited one another. In preparation for the moment of inhabitation in the text, the, nar the narrative has already used the second person singular pronoun with without speech marks in such a fashion as to merge Amin and Nina. Amin's ruling that Nina is neither French nor Algerian. Tu n'es pas française, tu n'es pas algérienne on page 22 returns to him in full force on page 40. Um, that this summation foreshadows exactly what Nina will soon say of herself as a biracial child in France in the 1980s, supports the supposition of a merging of selves under the one sign. I'll let you read those. I am you and you are me, the narrator seems to be saying. Like the first person plural pronoun, nous, which can be understood by the reader as inclusive, the second person singular, or tu, can also speak to and thus include the reader, just as it does a character connected with the narrator, which is Amin. Furthermore, since the pronoun tu refers equally to the first person narrator here, the reader who senses being addressed by the text thus also partakes in the narrator's own discourse in collaboration with their first person. Interpretive maneuvers such as these allow us to imagine how a writer may facilitate the, quote, the dialectical coming and going, to quote Sartre, of a generous reader into the first person narration so as to activate a reader, reader, con, uh, reader consciousness. Being able to isolate instances of the look in literary representations also reveals opportunities offered up by the writer for the reader to perceive with and as the narrator. These are recognizable in phenomenological experiences of interrelational objectification and subjectivity relayed by the narrator. Passages in Gasson Mulkey of the kind that repeatedly use the first or second person singular as seen are often immediately followed by paragraphs dedicated entirely to the third person plural before reverting directly back to a focused return on je or tu. In this way, Bouraoui replicates a commonly used mechanism of othering, exposing the binarism of us and them. The repeated reference to they and them can, of course, serve to communicate the narrator's sense of social exclusion, yet it also propels the empathetic reader back to an associated nous that they've already felt they belong to, or an established aggregate je form. Each return to a shared address that includes the reader, surrounds and thus diminishes the excluding potential of the third person plural by containing the source of other, othering. Containment of the other as subject points to an awareness of the Sartrean threat of the other on the freedom of the first person speaking subject. Repetitive use of the possessive pronoun further substantiates the supposition of, of such an awareness. Uh, the sharply punctuated passage that reads le regard, le mot, le jugement, calls attention to the ontological effects that result from the objectifying apparatus of the look. First, the look paralyzes, then discriminatory words define and rob the self of freedom. Finally, a sense of having been judged is felt by the self-rendered object. Fixed as métis in the critical gaze of the French metropolitan other as subject, the narrator's sense of shame at being found to be lacking alerts her to the power of the subject's look. What upholds a reading of the look in this passage is that the narrator does not make explicit who she is seen to be by the seeing other. This elicits that the look is understood by the narrator to deprive her of knowledge of the image held of her. Yet this realization does not paralyze the text because the narrator equally understands the exchangeable nature of the look. Her frequent refrain of je sais, used here in relation to nationality and provenance, um, emits an appropriative authority over the othering center, whose role is reverted to that of a fixed object of another's consideration. In instances where the narrator has become the appropriating knowing subject, as opposed to the known object, in contrast with the passage in which she experiences shame, the narrator here qualifies her knowledge, as we see in Moi je sais le maitri, moi je sais la guerre sans fin. 
Huawei can be seen to clearly replicate Sato's conception of the look here in a manner that lays the ground for readers' capacity to comprehend the effects and themselves perpetrate acts of objectification in the novel in collaboration with the narrator. It does take a dedicated act of the imagination to maneuver back and forth between self and textual other in this way. Yet when the textual I form of the, um, the racialized other, of woman as other, of um, the other whose gender and sexuality is read as non normative, is experienced as personal by another subject in the form of the reader, the unknown other ceases to be what Sartre calls a subject beyond the limits of our understanding because they becomes us, become us, they have become us. This ability to read the other as the self constitutes a powerful immersive potential of literature, one that could have a positive real world effect through the generation of individualized empathetic insights. To conclude, a survey carried out by the Le Centre National du Livre um, in 2021, following une année particulière, um, bibliophiles were said to attest to engage in read, the Reading Act for two main reasons. Firstly, for pleasure, and secondly, to learn and discover new things. The latter reason recalls Baudelaire's pronouncement in Voyage, in the poetry collection Les Fleurs du Mal, which reads, au fond de l'inconnu pour trouver du nouveau. Reading the final line of this poem differently in the present context, we can take these words to infer humanistic explorations, for in line with Satrian thinking, one of the greatest inconnu is surely the world of the other. Perhaps the engaged reading of first person fictional others may be one of the ways for us to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for that um, wonderful opening to today's proceedings. You've given us um, quite a lot to um, keep mulling over as, uh, as the conference moves forward, um, uh, not just in terms of uh, the, the text you discussed today, Bukhari's works, um, but also um, our own uh, work as researchers in a, a broader sense. So th thank you very much for that. Um, very rich discussion. Uh, so I would like to open um, the floor to questions now. Um, and as with um, our panels yesterday, uh, this is um, being recorded. So just be aware if you'd like to ask a question um, and not be part of the recording, you're free to do so through the chat, um, in which case I'll read out the question for you. Uh, otherwise, you can um, raise your hand and then unmute yourself and ask the question yourselves. Okay, do we have any questions to begin? No, nothing yet. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, a lot to um, to think through. Um, I might ask a question then um, to give everyone a chance to collect their thoughts. Um, so uh, I'm very interested in this this idea of um, how the the experience of of reader empathy can be um, transformative. Um, and uh, I'm sure this is something that you'll, um, you'll get to further along in the project. And I was just wondering what your initial thoughts were on um, how to study this, uh, this experience and um, how this might relate to uh, your own reading of Nina Bukhawi as well. I think I'm really at that stage where I need to um, start, yeah, start to analyze if this effect does take place, if other readers do feel the same way that I do. Um, I have never done any survey work uh, yet. Um, so far, you know, working with readers and their, their reception theory, etc. So I suspect that might be the next step to um, avoid just reading what I want to read or interpreting what I want to um, interpret in, in the texts. 
Um, it just seemed like I guess all of this came from a feeling I had when I when I read personally the, the intense feelings that I may have, particularly with a first person um, narrative. So I yeah I I guess I can't really speak to empathy en enormously since it's not something I've really studied yet. But it's, um, I guess it, yeah it just, I'm kind of motivated by the, the intense feelings of my own my own intense empathy I suspect or compassion perhaps that I feel like is generated through the first person um, narrative. So I'm, I guess I'm going to have to see if that kind of thing happens with other other readers too and how they describe that experience you know in their own words. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's it's going to be something really um, interesting to explore in terms of uh, the auto fiction genre as well. And um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot um, to be said moving forward. So yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, okay, uh, so I think we've got a question from Egli now. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Thank you. It was fascinating. Um, I was just wondering, um, I was interested in this idea of the look uh, as, uh, you know, that has sort of, um, can have a double function. It, it can sort of produce uh, empathy and identification with somebody. And at the same time, it can also uh, be objectifying. So I'm interested more in the first part of that idea because I'd never thought about it that way. So I was wondering whether you could maybe tell a little bit more about that idea and how uh, you developed it theoretically and maybe remind some of the names of the theorists that you referred to, because mm -hmm. I think I might have, well, other than such, <laughs> thanks. Um, the look doesn't, I don't feel that the look in, in real life and the phenomenological world doesn't, um, effect empathy. It's quite the opposite. It creates, according to Sartre, conflict because um, empathy comes from understand or trying to understand, put oneself in, in the shoes of the other and um, understand their subjective uh, point of view. But the look um, almost propels the, the other away from us um, and sets them as an object and as something that is only knowable through our own subjective um, analysis. So I don't, in, in real life, it doesn't work that way, but my um, feeling was that it could work in literature because there's perhaps this, this doubling up. So you have um, the possibility of the reader who, who has two sets of consciousnesses really, if they can enter into the narrator and see through the narrator's eyes, um, they are acting as the subject that creates an object of the other and therefore, um, which isn't particularly, isn't empathetic. But we also retain our own consciousness as um, individuals in our own right that we can use to analyze and um, create our own emotion about whatever it is we're seeing. So there's, there's a double kind of a doubleness there that allows us to do that. Um, that isn't possible in, in the real life. And understand that this is a little bit um, taught, it suggests that empathy can't, can't exist in the real world, of course, and that's clearly not the case. So I guess I need to read a lot more about the, the generation of empathy in um, maybe for, in philosophical terms, actually, rather than just in you know, theory of mind, etc. Um, the other theorists that I worked, that I used were, um, was Breihaupt, um, Fritz Breihaupt, um, who, Actually, I can send you the name of the book. Uh, there's there's a quite an extensive edited collection of different essays on theory of mind that offer lots of different theories of uh, of empathy. And his was one that put together a number of models that already exist, but in a more complex way. Um, and otherwise, I was I relied somewhat heavily on um, Fludenich, Monica Fludenich, who is, uh, works in narratology, and her notion of um, what narrative does and how narrative works uh, also connects in some way to being an empathetic subject because it requires you to think about your own experiences and translate and transmute those um, in a universal kind of sense onto those that you read and that, that you um, that you ingest and guess through the reading process. So those two theorists helped me I guess water down a little bit the philosophy that's probably a bit dense um, as well. 
Thank you. Thank you, Aglay, for the question and Alex for your answer. Uh, do we have any other questions? Um, I'll jump to uh, Michel first. Uh, hi, Alex. Thank you very much for uh, this very interesting talk. I was wondering if you've thought of um, or if you've um, worked on graphic novels or to fictional graphic novels that no, no. would add another layer, obviously, with the with the visuals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It could be more complex. I, I guess yes. <laughs> more complex just in the sense that when there is a visual, you are quite well aware that the the eye figure is not it, it's other it's sent off into the you know becomes third person, becomes he, she, they, um, or them. Um, and I I I've thought about this a little bit in terms of films. I kind of I did question myself when I first came up with this notion, which was really partly due to my frustration that you know, people don't read as much as they used to, or maybe even I don't get to read as much as I used to. And I really wanted to focus on suggesting that um, literature had something very special about it, as opposed to um, media, um, digital media. And it seemed to me, of course, I haven't dealt, you know, haven't delved into this enough, but it seemed to me that because there was a visual image, like let's say a, a very intimate um, auto, a biopic even, or autobiographical type of film that you feel like you're drawn into in the same kind of way as you would be drawn into an autofiction or just an eye, um, uh, an eye figure narrative, is that you can see that person, see that you know that they are not you. I feel, I don't know how, how one maybe would, um, forget that or suspend that, uh, that that knowledge. This is probably where I got stuck in terms of the, the visual, but perhaps it could be very interesting to, as you say, look at graphic novels and see if there, there could be a way of um, superseding that. Mm -hmm. well I, if if I may, I was um, I was particularly I was just thinking of Marcelino Tuong's uh, two mm -hmm. graphic novels on the on the war on the Vietnam War because mm -hmm. um, yes of course you see him as a child and, and as a teenager mm -hmm. uh, and he's definitely other you know from me uh, mm -hmm. he's male to start with and and, and Franco-Vietnamese but I did develop empathy mm -hmm. by by with a mother also not yeah. just with him but with that uh, so I don't know it was just a thought you're right. I mean, the, the image or well, the um, the artistic image is, is another representation in the same way that the, the written word is or literature is. So why could it not work in that same way? Why do, would we not make that same, you know, use those same maneuvers to um, to allow ourselves entry? Hmm. Thank you for that. I've had those. I mean, it's a it's a leap, but you know, it, we do that by by reading uh, fiction yeah. or auto fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, thank you. I have a, quite a few Vietnamese graphic novels I need to get, need to start reading, so that could be a motivation. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, Beth, do you have a question that you'd like to ask as well? Yeah, um, it's actually funny. I was actually going to take it in a similar direction. I'm glad the conversation played out in that way. Um, I was just thinking um, that for the mention for the reasons that you mentioned Nina Bukhavi is quite a an ideal example for this but um because of the first person nature of the work it's very specific um and I was just going to ask if you think that it um to what extent would it play out um this idea of like the dyad and the gaze um and uh how would that play out in purely fictional works um so fiction kind of au sens propre where um there is no explicit I um, but nonetheless, that I think this I and the other could could play out. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any examples or if there was a similarities or differences between those those two different genres. Um, yeah, that's my question. I actually thought of, when I started to work on this particular idea that um, it was a bit dangerous to use autofiction because there is an autobiographical self, there's a biographical self that can be imagined as the, the eye figure and therefore that kind of thing could almost block the capacity to um, make that, that leap or that um, entrance into the, 
um, into the jeu. I think in fiction, my feeling was that fiction would be the ideal place for this to work. Um, and I guess taking Nina Bourari was to, to kind of test the limits a little bit. But I, what I found was that because she fictionalizes so much through the splitting of the eye figure or splitting of the self, I think we are able to forget more readily that, that um, the Nina in the, in the text or in the novel is also the Nina writing. Um, so my sense is that um, fiction would work much better and more, much more naturally, but I have restricted myself to um, narration in the first person because I don't, I, again, I can't feel a little blocked. I don't quite see how, um, how I can argue for uh, the entrance into a third person narrator because of the, it's just such an expansive world. Although I know, I do understand, we do have as much empathy, I'm quite sure, when reading those, those texts as we would do in a um, first person text. But at the moment I felt, perhaps because of the way the, the gaze works in, in such a personal sense, I felt that I should limit myself, um, recover myself as well, um, by using the, the first person only. But that's something to explore perhaps later on when I have a better, maybe a wider and more, um, yeah, overarching understanding of, of Sartre maybe. Yeah, absolutely. I also think with this, um, this topic and this kind of approach that, that you've developed, um, you've only got so many hours in the day and I think that you can apply it just as Michelle brought up, which I think is a particularly interesting angle, especially when we're talking about the gays. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of avenues um, and it would be exciting to see where, where the project goes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Beth. Um, so do we have any final questions? Uh, yes, we've got a question from Diana Hall. Right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry, just to follow up on, on that last point, um, it's the, the concept of focalization seems fairly crucial because um, while whilst I, I, I completely understand why you're dealing essentially with first person narratives, the, the, what, with the third person narrative that uses varied focalization, for example, in Stil um, Indirect Libre, Free Indirect Discourse, what you have is actually a kind of entry into another subjectivity and simultaneously an acknowledgement of your presence, your presence along with the narrator mm -hmm. as a, another consciousness. So that kind of duality in a way manages to encompass, I think, a, an empathetic identification with the, with the other. So it, it might be interesting when, when you can to, you know, to look at those kinds of third person narration that do use varying often focalization with different characters to allow you also an entry into another consciousness because yeah. the majority of fiction probably that we read is is third person <laughs> that's right it's really, um yeah it's quite limiting isn't it quite restrictive yeah that sounds i thank you so much for that i'll have a look into it and yes if it does as you said I perhaps make an argument for it um being a clear um, example of this jumping between these two selves, the, the bringing together of these two points of view. Mm, thank you. They're almost held together, aren't they, in, in free and direct discourse. The, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a very effective technique for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so I'd like uh, everyone to join together in um, thanking uh, Dr. Alex Kerman one final time for her keynote this morning. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for your questions and comments. Um, so uh, we're going to, to take a short break now before the first panel for the day. Um, so we'll be back at uh, quarter past nine and um, Egle will take over as chair and uh, we'll be hearing papers on um, maternity and political protest. Okay. So
Sorry. Thank you long, very much. How long is the break? It's not quarter past nine here. How long? How many minutes? Ah, uh, sorry, ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. I'll see you all very shortly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Are you going to be able to stick around for the, the other papers this morning? Yes, looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say um, in the lead up to your talk, I was listening, to, uh, sorry, I was reading um, Tous les hommes désirent naturellement savoir. Um, and I feel like that uh, that works really nicely in terms of what you were saying as well. Um, and uh, especially in the, like the um, framing of the narrative as well, the, the different categories of savoir, devenir, um, souvenir, être, mm -hmm. um, and how she like breaks down those different um, experiences that the reader goes through as well, of discovering the character. Um, and themselves through the character. So, yes, I yeah. actually read that initially because I wanted to use that uh, her latest novel um, for this particular um, presentation. And then I found myself more easily drawn to being able to explain what's happening with um, the Garçon Monkey. Uh, but certainly the way that she moves from one group of people to another and from one time to another, and that, that is kind of evidence of being able to access multiple selves or multiple um, mm. yeah, first person selves, uh, which generates empathy in, in many different kinds of scenarios with different kinds of characters. So yeah, I was actually thinking about incorporating that next. I do find her work really, very useful in this particular way. And there's a repetition of themes, of course, and the same kinds of narrative report that's recalled again in later works. Um, so they can be brought together more easily. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and like I said, I think it uh, it works really, really well in terms of um, auto fiction, mm -hmm. especially because mm -hmm. it's quite heavy on the fiction side. Yeah, but then there's um, yeah, there's that that level of reflexivity that allows the reader to really jump in um, nicely into that that processing of fictionalizing the self, understanding those experiences through fiction. Mm. Um, it's like the, yeah, for, I get that, that impression that the author's kind of, yeah, mm. talking through what I'm going through at the same time, um, which, yeah, really lends you your idea of, of um, that transformative experience. Mm. It's really such a wide reaching subject that I think I've got these quite strict parameters around it because, as you say, mm. how we fictionalize the self. It's another mm. topic to, um, to enter into. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I might go and grab something to eat quickly. Yeah, of course. Alex, yeah. Uh, just a, a minute. Another another thing also. I, uh, I, I was still here and listen, listening to you. And the Arnaud Mémoire de Fille could be also an interesting, um, an interesting, I don't know, <laughs> novel, a book, I see, you know, where she's, because uh, you have the je and the elle, elle, the girl of, the, of 58, and, and, and the fact that she was slut-shamed. So between the content and, uh, and the form and content, yeah, does that make sense? Yes, form and content, that, would, that could be interesting for you. I don't know. Yeah, it could be interesting is finding a way to enter from the je into the elle who is the same person. Right. Yeah, it could be very useful in extending I don't know. from the first person to the third. Mm. Thank you very much for that. I'll let you have a break. <laughs> Thank you.
Right, I think everybody is here now and we are ready to go for, with the first panel um, uh, today. And we'll start with Josephine Goldman, who is going to give a paper uh, on um, um, intersexual mothering. But um, so Josephine Goldman is a second year PhD candidate at the University of Sydney and her PhD project United by Water, Art and Gender across the Francophone, Caribbean and Pacific regions explores the representation of the multivalent relationship between water, islands, and femininity in literature, film, and visual art. Uh, so um, we'll have 15 uh, minutes for this uh, paper entitled Intersexual Mothering in Guy Gabon's La Montée des Eaux and Marie Condé en attendant La Montée des Eaux. The floor is yours, Josephine. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to begin today by acknowledging the Indigenous owners of the land I'm speaking from, the Awabakal people. My paper today explores the theme of immersion in two works by two contemporary Guadeloupean artists. Uh, Guy Gabon's film, short film, La Montée des Eaux from 2015, and Maurice Condé's novel, En attendant La Montée des Eaux from 2010. I approach this concept of immersion on two levels, images of physical immersion in bodies of water to explore alternative maternities, and the crafting of an immersive dynamic which travels the boundaries of discrete texts and creates an intertextual maternal body of work. Images of water are crucial to each artist's representation of non-traditional maternities, allowing the artist to traffic in the currency of dominant images of water as feminine and life-giving in order to then blur the boundaries of these representations. First, I will look at some examples of watery non-maternity and maternity in Gabon, then Condé's works, and then I will present what I see as Gabon's effort to position her texts within a Caribbean artistic matrilineage, notably through her naming decision in the title of this work. Guy Gabon is a contemporary artiviste, a term she gives herself as an artist dedicated as much to political activism as to aesthetics. Her multidisciplinary oeuvre, spanning environmental land art, installation, video and performance art, is resolutely feminist and eco-critical. She began her artistic work in 2007 with a land art installation project focused on recycled waste, and then began exploring image and film in 2012. Gabon's work is anchored in Caribbean philosophical and aesthetic space, something reinforced by her referential naming practices. Indeed, apart from this film, La Monte des Eaux, evidently named after Condé's novel, On attendant La Monte des Eaux, she has named her 2019 and 2020 exhibitions at the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum, after written works by Martinican philosopher Edouard Clisson and Guadeloupean writer Simon Schwartzberg. I suggest that these naming choices serve to create an immersive cultural and textual space in ways that I'll explore further throughout this presentation. Water is the central concept, image and element in Gabon's portrayal of her own relationship to maternity and non-maternity in La Monte des Eaux. In the introduction to La Monte des Eaux, Gabon, as narrator, describes her relationship with the waters of her island home, Guadeloupe, thus. L'île aux belles eaux où je suis née sert de décor à mon exploration du lien organique, intime et émotionnel qui nous relie à l'eau tout au long de la vie. Cette eau qui est mon refuge et ma source, pourra-t-elle épaiser ma douleur de ne pas être mère, combler l'absence indicible, remplir le creux? The bodies of water on her island are sites of refuge, providing respite for her pain, a pain entangled with identities of womanhood and motherhood. In this short film, Gabon portrays women as both mothers and children. They are accepted into the womb of the water, visually represented through clips of women being gently dragged in circles underwater, as you can see a still of on the top, uh, and they accept water into themselves as figurative child, represented through the visual of water filling up a hollowed out sand womb, as you can see in the lower picture. The lines between women and water are porous, 
challenging discrete individuality. The water fills the women and the women are, are held in the safety of the sea. Two of the most powerful images of the short film are tracings of the human female body into the partially submerged compacted sand of Guadeloupe. In these sequences, Gabon enacts a feminist, post-colonial and eco-critical reclaiming of the landscape, emphasizing the claim that Guadeloupean, have to, Guadeloupean women have to the land, while simultaneously foregrounding the way nature inhabits human understandings of identity. The first to appear is a line drawing of a female body carved into rock, partially submerged in a stream that you can see on the left. Water and tiny fish are marking their passage through human-made crevices, entangling the human and non-human stories of Guadeloupean landscape and overwriting colonial histories of white European men claiming this landscape and the bodies of enslaved women in the name of France. I'll return to this image in the latter section of the paper and explore the second key image now, that on the right, a female figure carved into the sand of the shoreline of the beach. This time, Gabon herself has carved this figure. We hear her claim the penetration of the land in voiceover. J'inscris l'empreinte de mon corps en creux de mes sables. C'est les traces visibles, invisibles, d'une mémoire douloureuse que le mer vient recouvrir, tremblée jusqu'à la forcement. So Gabon inscribes the print, the mark of her body, into the earth and water of the landscape. Again, as we saw in the previous image of both water and fish reaffirming the long ago penetration of the rock by the woman's sign, this sand woman is created through Gabon's hollowing out of the land, as well as the penetration of the sea. This eco-critical affirmation of the agency of non-human nature is reinforced sonically. Gabon's spoken words, her claim of agency and ownership over the imprint of her body in the sand, are interrupted and partially obscured by the gentle crashing of waves creating a polyvocal dialogue between woman and sea. The ambiguity of her, words, of her words lends further meaning to them, notably through the sonic confusion of la mer, the mother, and la mer, the sea. Indeed, we could translate this line quite differently if this one word is changed. Notably, situating the mother in this line produces a possible different meaning from recouvrir, suggesting the integration of the trace of this painful memory into oneself. Further, it, bl it blurs the line between mothers and non-mothers by giving the title of mère to she who is unable to have a human child, hinting at alternative possibilities of maternity. As we listen to the intermingling of Gabon's poetic voiceover and the waves, the sea fills the hollow of the sand womb. This positions a post-human envisaging of impregnation, of the sea penetrating the human. Yet in this vision, the sea is not only the penetrator, Rather, it takes the position of the fetus in the sand woman's womb, protected by the female figure, temporarily infantilized. Here, an alternative mother-child relationship develops. Not only does the sea hold the adult woman as its child by providing her a refuge in grief, but the sand woman also holds the sea as her child, this woman carrying sea image offering a potential alternative maternity. In the last sequence of the film, the perfect circle of the belly, once calmly containing the trickle of water that had flowed in from the sea to fill it, is broken open and the lower half of the figure is erased. This ambivalent image suggests at least two possible readings, either that the enclosing structure of the belly has been overwhelmed and the sea, the grief, has breached its bounds, or that the held seawater, the fetus, has been born, flowing back out into the broader ocean. Thus, Gabon positions the sea both as repository of grief for non-maternity and as joyous alternative for post-human creativity. While Gabon may not be able to carry a human child, she can and indeed must care for and love the non-human world in order to work against the danger of environmental collapse. Now I turn to Maurice Condé's novel, En attendant le monde des Maurice Condé is a much celebrated author of fiction and essays and is among Guadeloupe's most well-known writers nationally and internationally since publishing her first novel in 1976. In En attendant la montée des published in 2010, Condé traces the stories of three men, Babaka, Mouva, and Foua, whose lives are brought into contact through the birth of a little girl, Anaïs, which results in the death of her mother, Renette. Condé undertakes a nuanced portrayal of mothering and non-mothering, by exploring what I term the masculine maternity of these three men who, in the absence of Renette, work together to mother Anaïs. 
Like Gabon, Condé centers the materiality of water in her portrayals of relationships to maternity, which deviate from what is expected. Water is often figured as a warning or a threat in her navigation of the masculine maternal. This occurs notably in the threat of rising seas due to climate change and in the depiction of sea voyages which echo the Middle Passage. Condé's masculine maternal is distinct from paternity or fatherhood, exploring tropes of maternity and qualities associated with femininity brought together in men's bodies, especially consistent with her broader representations of maternity throughout her oeuvre. I use the language of maternity in part to emphasize the primary caregiving role of the men, especially Babaka in this novel. While time is too limited for an extensive exploration of Condé's portrayal of the masculine maternal here, I want to touch on a few examples of this uncommon representation of maternity and Condé's ambivalent, sometimes threatening representation of water. A first example is Babacar, the obstetrician and adoptive mother of Anaïs, who consistently defines himself in relation to three deceased women in his life, his mother, grandmother, and first wife. Babaka was drawn to obstetrics because of his admiration for his grandmother and her work as a sage femme or wise woman, which included delivering babies. Through his desire, though his desire to become a sage femme was rebuked for gender transgression by his grandmother, he nonetheless feels drawn to this woman's work, reflecting, Pourquoi les hommes ne peuvent-ils qu'apporter la mort, soldat, kamikaze, tueur en série? Ne peuvent-ils pas être aussi les accouchés de vie? Moreover, in Condé's exploration of the relationship between maternity and water in this text, water carries ambivalence and even threat. In the depiction of Anais's birth and naming, Condé introduces two images of water, one bringing life, the other danger. In speaking to the baby Anais, Babaka declares, tout est la sauce retrouvée qui va irraguer l'aridité de mon existence. Then contrasting this rep positive representation of water only half a page later, Babaka's friend, friend Ugo, a former meteorologist, warns Babaka of the threat of sea level rise, transforming water into a bringer of death. And I'll let you read this quote on the screen. In this ominous prediction, Ugo evokes sea level rise, as well as other symbolic resonances of water that have particular significance for Caribbean descendants of enslaved Africans, leaving nothing, uh, namely the Middle Passage. The sea in this quotation threatens to overwhelm Guadeloupe leaving nothing of the Caribbean but the sea as memory. This depiction of the sea as memory, akin to Derek Walcott's famous characterization of the sea as history, speaks to a broader depiction of the sea as the repository of the traumatic history of the Middle Passage, of bodies who jumped and were thrown overboard. The Middle Passage is also present in sea voyages depicted in the novel, notably that taken by Mulvar, a second masculine mother to Anaïs, and Renette, her deceased biological mother, from Haiti to Guadeloupe. Describing the journey to Babacar, Morva emphasizes the seemingly endless nature of the journey. Change slide. <laughs> Across a sea which seems without distinguishing features, impossible to locate oneself in, which echoes Condé's previous depiction of the Middle Passage journey of Wangara, Babacar's ancestor. Thus, this complex association of water and sea with threat and painful memory, as well as life, is interweaved with Condé's exploration of unconventional mothering and complex relationships with deceased and present mothers. So through Im immersive images of water, both artists explore alternative maternities, which challenge the limits of bodies and borders. Beyond this, immersion emerges as a relational dynamic between the two works, expanding the thematic exploration of maternity and matriarchal lineage into the space of intertextuality. Through her referential naming choices, Gabon extends her own images of watery maternity to also include Condé's, and moreover creates a new textual maternal corpus and the foundations of an artistic matrilineage. Returning to the first image of Gabon's film that I talked about, in Gabon's image of the female figure carved into rock, which I introduced earlier, Gabon not only reinforces her connection to her history and to her land, but also extends her message into the space of intertextuality. The sequence is shot with a handheld camera, which slowly pans down the rock shelf of a creek to reveal a female figure carved into partially submerged rock. Gabon speaks in voiceover while tracing her fingertips through the lines of the rock. 
Tracing over the top half of the figure, the part not submerged in water, Gabon says, the trace sur cette roche qui a traversé le temps me relie à la ligne de femme, mais j'appartiendrai jamais à cette ligne de mer. Then we hear only the trickling sounds of the water over the rock figure, as Gamon's hand continues its passage to the circle, which represents the figure's belly, the signifier of the pregnancy Gabon cannot achieve, and the barrier to her belonging to this ligne de mer. Her hand must be immersed in water to reach and trace this circle as the lower half of the figure is submerged in the creek. The silence, or rather a seeding of human voice to the non-human voice of the trickling fresh water, as Gabon's hand traces the roundness of the belly, is significant. She is unable to contribute to one of these legacies, this lineage of mothers, and as she seeks refuge from the pain this disconnection creates in her intimate, creates in her intimate relationship with water, so refuge is a source, the water speaks for her. Moreover, the passage of the trickling water joins her to a third unarticulated lineage, those women artists who have left their mark on the land of Guadeloupe and carved out space into its literary landscape. Implied in the movement of the water is its predicted flow, from inner Guadeloupe to the sea where it disperses and proliferates, a flow mirrored by the movement of Guadeloupean art from this island throughout the world. Thus, this sequence is a reversal of the colonizer's incursion inwards. By embracing the materiality of water, Gabon's story, a continuation of the Guadeloupe and Metro lineage, is established through parallels with Condé's work, seeps across borders and flows into the sea to wash over the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So if you don't mind, we'll now proceed with the second paper and then we'll hold on to questions for afterwards, if that's okay with you. So I would like now to invite um, Deshaina Shankar to um, start unmuting her uh, for her microphone. And um, uh, Dakshaini is an early career researcher in French studies and has extensive experience in communications and journalism in Australia and the United States. She's a visiting graduate student at Emory University and will commence her PhD in French there in this year. Deshani just completed her master in translation studies at the University of Western Australia, specializing in the hidden politics of gender within translations of Patrick Chamozo's work. Outside of research, she handles health communications in West Australian hospitals. She first earned her reporting chops covering the Trump presidency for NBC News, ABC Politics, and CNN when she was pursuing her undergraduate degree at New York University. So um, today's paper uh, is entitled Womb as Forestry, Feminine Tyranny in Cellular Wood Tensis La Vie de Me. And the floor is yours now. All right, thanks. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right, I hope everyone can see this. Please let me know if you can't. Yeah. All right, just one second. Okay. So Lidi Modileno, a preeminent scholar who has focused on Congolese writer, what, I, what we would call the father of Francophone literature coming out of the Congo, Sonila Boutonsis, has argued that scholars who have focused on Sonila Boutonsis, La Vie et Demi in particular, have largely ignored the potent role science fiction plays in representing a racial Africa because of that over-reliance or over-consumption in looking at magical realism that appears in the first half and its connection to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Marquez's The Hundred Years of Solitude. Now, I add to what Moody Leno stipulates about that ignorance of that science fiction that appears in the second half by countering that La Boutonsi actually breaks through it and destabilizes what is science and what is barbaric by installing a secret connection, the womb, that works to destabilize both realms. Now, the central magical realism element appears in the form of character Shaidana Ogrosheva, whom I will call Shaidana here. She is perceived as an African pygmy woman who marries totalitarian leaders, Geats, Hondri or Kertontre, then Jonker de Pair. But Shaidana is actually born within the totalitarian dominated nation, Katamalanasi, a fictionalized Congo, under the care of the fisherman, Laisho in Yorma. And she ultimately flees to the Darmelian forest, so the outside territory that is considered 
not a part of this fictionalized Congo, when the reigning totalitarian leader of her time, the Guide Providentiel, tracks down her guardian and assassinates her entire family. So the forest is where Sharana blossoms into a tyrannical device against totalitarianism via the intercultural experiences she shares with the Pygmy community. And when she re-emerges out of the forest, she begins, to, she begins a plan that ultimately asks if the womb must annihilate the children it fosters to return Africa to a point zero. So from the moment Sharana is born, there is a sense she doesn't belong to the tropical universe La Boutoncy constructs around the totalitarian leaders. She's born in fisherman region within that fictionalized Congo where les pêcheurs ont toujours dans tous les pays du monde la réputation d'avoir plus d'humanité que le reste des hommes. So the distinction La Boutoncy accords to the fishermen to possess more humanity than other citizens precludes that they do not conform to the magical realism or to the ties of sexuality, cruelty, and violence that is associated with this magical realism that streams from the Gid, the totalitarian leader, onto his people. Shadana's birth also introduces a special dimension to this tropicalized magical realism that did not previously exist. As Moody Leno says, magical realism limits the representation of violence to the closed to the closed spaces of the city, the presidential palace, the La Vie de Mille Hotel, or the bedroom. And the birthing of this bloodline, Shaidana, is expect, expected to be mired in this tropicality because of where she is born within that region outside its control, marks that she is different and may not necessarily belong entirely to this fictionalized Congo or its magical realism, and may be that desired political agent that is able to create a new African nation state to counter it. This becomes more evident in the fisherman Laisho's observations of Shairana and her twin brother Martial as they grow up. He distinguishes between the two, noting Martial avait le visage tropical, les yeux rampo, mais ses oreilles accidentaires faisaient penser à un gorille. Shairana était sa mère, sa grande beauté commençait à faire parler de Laisho et de Shankar Selaka. So the visage tropical coupled with the allusion to a gorilla foreshadows that Martial may follow in the footsteps of the totalitarian leader at that time, the Guide Providentiel, as La Boutoncy calls him, described to have a bushy body, such of an old gorilla, if the twin brother is left to ascend into adulthood. Now, in contrast, the only reference Shadana bears to Katamalanasi, or that sense of tropicality caught within that fictionalized state, is her physical resemblance, sa grande beauté, to her mother. So her mother slides into multiple identities ranging from Madame Obaltana to Chanka Selata, her final identity, to evade this totalitarian leader while seducing and poisoning members of his cabinet and military to avenge the horrifying that the entire family suffered under his regime. Now, while Shaidana descends from this very family that gets caught up in a tropicality it resists against, her resemblance to Laisho mentioned here signals she will not follow the fate of those that come before her because she bears his humanity, a quality that positions her as an outcast in the state's totalitarian circle. But Shaidana does not recognize the difference she possesses until she's forced to enter the forest. So as the twins go fishing, they are oblivious to the Guide Providencia's guards hunting them down. And when they return to Yorma, an old man alerts them that the totalitarian leader is after them and they divert from the river straight into the forest to escape. Now entering the forest, through the river is not coincidental. It is symbolic of the paysage jumeau a cayon la fille de personnage. So progressing from their mother, who flees the guide on gagnant les rives du fleuve, the children recognize that that sense of pervasive bestialism within the fictionalized state tied to magical realism has broken out of its confines, mainly to the city's walls, as well as the state walls, and now come onto the rivers and are after symbols of resistance laisho and what remains of their mother, her ashes. They venture deep into the Damulian forest to complete the circle of escape in Pesa Jumo. However, the twins accustomed to the fisherman life are very uneasy amidst the solitude they first experience in the forest. Face à l'homme, la virginité de nature sera la même impitoyable source de question, le même cré de plénitude où tout vous montre doit invisible la solitude de l'homme dans l'infini des inconscients et ce désespoir si dont on finit par l'appeler le néant. So the forest reduces all the theatrical politics around the deed and the growing descent within the fictional estate into nothingness in its depth. In its depth. An abyss away from hell, the forest instigates the twins to feel désespoir because the sites and values, as well as the political system they raised on no longer apply here. 
Aside of point zero, the forest is an aquifer pre-colonialism before le bâtiment qui a remplacé l'arbre, le béton qui a chassé le feuillage, la métaphore de l'intrusion ravageuse de l'Occident. The forest is the untouched survival of colonialism, a site of memory that aims to remind those residing in today's Congo that Kinhasa n'a pas son cœur dans le béton et le néant, in Le, le Boutonsi's words. And we didn't shut on our statement, La Folie Nous Get, right after she enters the forest. There is a brief moment of awakening that sees her process a distinctive, distinctive lack of borders the forest bears and the chance she gets from it to restart her life. And in the process of being initiated into the forest, she encounters the African pygmies and has to successfully survive their rite of initiation. So the rite of initiation is when a young African pygmy places a dose of what La Boutonsi calls shamanakang, which is empoison de liane, into the monkey he prepares for the twins to eat, while pygmy hunter Kabahashu, who first advocated for them to join his community, hunts. The twins are both poisoned with a paralysis taking over their body. Now the twin brother Marcel dies, but Shaidana lives. Her passage through medical death and rebirth into forest culture renders her paralyzed, much as her mother Shaidana, who bears the same name as her, who gives birth paralyzed in the fisherman region to the twins. Now the moments of paralysis from Shaidana's birth that mother and daughter share anchors Shaidana to her mother's womb, a holding state of resistance against the fictionalized Congo state. But she severes this umbilical cord when she dies from the poisoning and is reborn as an African pygmy woman with the behavior of an infant in her young adult body. She babbles learning Swasson mot de la langue de Kabahashu, the pygmy language, but matures at, an, matures at an accelerated pace, speaking full sentence, quand le monde sera mort là-bas, on honora encore ici, which means that even if the world outside dies, the forest will still be here. Now the process of maturity she experiences, something that La Boutonsi doesn't really attach a time code to, tells us that the forest has a spectral quality to time that does not conform to the fictionalized Congo's man-made time system forced upon during colonial rule. This spectral quality extends to the forest's resources, bodies of plant cells that have the potent ability to disintegrate or elevate the human. I'll let you read the whole passage, but I'll just pick out some four points. So let's say, pour mettre dans les yeux pour voir très loin, et pour voir dans la nuit, les yeux pour mettre dans les narines pour respirer l'animal, le dôme à distance, La gamme des poisons, la gamme de drogues, les mots aussi, les mots qui guérissent, les mots qui font le bois, les mots qui donnent la chance, ce qu'il a dû. So the pygmy hunters use of sensory terms here, bois, respire, educate Shredana on how the forest contains natural resources that can affect the human senses, such that it can kill them or give them a second chance of life. And the term la chance against la tue, specifically under les mots, alludes to Shredana surviving the poison trap, the sap, sorry, and being elevated to Mère de Clan, the mother of the clan from surviving. Now passing the rite of initiation sees her develop an equal relationship to the forest such that it tells her its secrets at night, that which no year has ever heard of. And this relationship compels her to very much forget her age and only really remember the phrase, c'était la forêt de ton, la forêt de vie, dans la forêt de son beau corps. And the inclusion of some boko here gives Shadana's body a sense of sacredness that never existed in Patamalanasi, that fictionalized state, because there was rampant sexualized masculine and masculinized rape pervasive there. And some boko notes to Article 7 of the real life Congolese constitution that decrees the human body to be sacred and violation of the body to represent a serious infringement of the constitution. Now, based upon La Boutonsi's placement of the masculinized Congo, as living off the forest, the constitution and aggregate principle of governance that instructs the legitimization of power is controlled by the forest. And during any such violation of the constitution, the public body in the form of the totalitarian leaders may think that they can do whatever they choose to, but they cannot control or eliminate the mind and thought processes that challenge leadership. And Shadana's womb on which the forest rests is what influences the constitution and gives it a chance to determine the progression of a nation or cut it off before it takes the forest into destruction. But the female tyrant doesn't emerge until there is this violation of her sacredness. And it comes in the form of when totalitarian leader, Guy Jean Claude de Père, captures her and essentially forces her into marriage. Now, during that post-marriage scene, he gives her un cascade de wheat chiffre Ontario while she's unconscious, which is essentially rape. And the Guide's Gifle Ontario is only one half of this violation because her grandfather, Marcel, first appears as a ghost and gives her half a dozen 
gifle that leads that leads to her passing out. And this double masculine violation is very much in breach of the Congolese constitution. But the womb doesn't necessarily drown the baby inside within a miscarriage, but expels it at birth. So she gives birth to son Kamachu Patatra, who will become later totalitarian deed, Jonka de Pierre. And she initially aims to try and get him to absorb the force of smell, sounds, and sights in their hourly talks. But she's forced to come to grips that the phallus will always violate the sacred female space, the body, when her son creates an annual week of virgins and impregnates 50 women yearly on live telecast, on live telecast, Le Guide et la Production. So the live broadcast is actually a mimesis of former Congolese dictator Mobutu Sese Seko's promulgation of a family code during his time that legalized polygamy, relieved husbands of responsibility for the maintenance of wives and children, and lowered the age of consent to 13 years old for women so he could bed them across the towns he visited. Now, Labutonsi reverses this real life masculine gra grasp on power to the female body in Shaidana's ejection of her son out of the forest through the lemo in the letter she addresses to him. So she says, Soit maudit comme les terres du désert, deviens donc l'importe des malédictions d'en bas et celles d'en haut. Je te retire l'ordre de mes gens pour que le diable te possède, qu'il fasse plus horrible nuit dans ta vie. So she expels him from this protective amniotic sac and relinquishes her rights as a mother over him. And this is reflected in her decision to open 30 bank accounts of 16 billion each to support her 30 grandsons that come out of that live telecast, La Guida e La Producción. And they ultimately rebel with her against her son and their father. Now the grandson's connection to the forest, why the grandmother is fraught with a masculine desire to mutilate their father. Stating money is un am um, arbitrable, they establish multiple industries to run the nation state Darmelia. And there's no reflection on their part about how much their grandmother has given through her money and the force that she is. is. They tear the source of the res resistance apart with industrialization and the pandering to European civilization. I will let you read the full passage, but essentially the grandsons adopt the approach of science as a surrogate of power, a belief that only modernity is capable of overthrowing the pervasive sense of bestiality and sexual sexuality that is tied to that fictionalized Congo state. Now they thirst for technology sees them establish new industries the forest has not seen, from tannery to controlling plants to west research, as well as mining, for instance, exploité avec une compagnie la belge avec l'aluminium, uranium, for example. Now the real life plundering and mismanagement of the Congo forest as we speak today in its logging, clearing, poaching, and mining, such that the forest degrades at 2 million acres yearly, foretells that the womb that Labutonsi writes about within his novel may reach a period where it must die or extricate itself from the forest it's attached to. And this period arrives when her grandson, John Calcium, behind West Research, releases his deadly flies to attack all the Katamalanasi regions. So aged 129, Sharana understands she's close to death and states, C'est la faute des corps qui se souvient that il y aura un zone de ses ancêches, tout sera chabon, les rivières s'éteindront, la forêt mourra de chaleur, puis il pleuvra pour des siècles et des siècles. She concludes her grandsons are rooted in a cyclical thirst for masculine supremacy that comes out of their drowning in a nameless eclipse, of losing something difficult to name, slavery, and of a prospect and promised independence. They harbor what is dead in their bodies and embark on genocide. Sharana allows the genocide to run its course, reducing the fictionalized state of Congo, as well as Darmelia and its forests into ashes. The only thing that remains is the city Shaidanka, renamed from Granita, once the capital of the forest. Now Shaidanka is a composite of Shaidana and her mother's last identity, Shanka, where the law forbids memories of war and secession within a newly built city. The choice to identify the surviving city as feminine, particularly of two women manipulated by men for political purposes, departs from decades of masculine stimulated rule and leans on the womb to return Africa to a point zero. This point zero requires Shadana to lose the sacredness of femininity, femininity and motherhood as a female blood right and right during the convergence of political and social vectors that considered her flesh and her vagina the prime commodity of exchange. She leaves the forest to her grandsons and takes the womb to rid her to death. So the forest is dead, the flesh is dead. Can we say the womb is dead too? 
Now the womb hides itself inside the female tyrant. This is very much the time to remember that the bloodline she comes from has an uncanny ability to appear in spectral form. While Shaidana never appears as a ghost, unlike her mother and grandfather, she leaves her womb in the spectrality of time that outpaces that of the body. So the womb chooses to return to give the city a second chance at life in its own time when the last vestiges of masculinity reflected through a declining grandson, John Carlson, disappear. There is very much mixed hope in Labatonsi's ending that the womb can actually re return after the point zero, so long as masculinity is kept at bay. Whether it is a tropical, whether it's tropical or barbaric or modern, the African nations govern with what Lady Mudilano calls their, fa their, phallic, uh, their phallic desire, driven with a need to pummel through African resources and outdo its former colonialist states. The womb in its bond to being the forest affords the nation a chance to feed off, its feed off its nutrients and establish a new order. However, the masculine body is so tied to violating the female body that the womb hidden has to pretty much, as Lady Murilana says, subi le sang and ab abandon its children, counting only on itself to self-regenerate an Africa that is very much drowning at its core within a masculinized desire for supremacy. And that is all, thank you. Thank you. Right, so we are a little bit over the time, but we still do have some time for discussion, which is good. So, um, well, but two fascinating papers with many, with some um, overlaps as well. So um, I will open the floor to questions without further ado. Does anybody have any questions or comments? You can also type them in the chat if you'd like, uh, or you can raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask the questions. Perhaps I'll start with a question then while you're all uh, sort of gathering your thoughts. Um, so I was thinking about, uh, it's a question maybe to, to, to both of you. Um, so, um, I was just wondering, because I don't know the, well, apart from Maurice Condé, I don't really know the other authors all that well. So I was wondering um, sort of about their reception and about the, the sort of the outreach uh, of their work, uh, you know, how well they, how widely they are read, viewed, uh, and how they are sort of received uh, critically and, and in, in um, I don't know, in the press maybe. So maybe Josephine, you'd like to start? We'll maybe let Dakshai get her breath. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, as you've said, Maurice Condé is very famous, so I'll, I'll leave her. But um, Guy Gabon is, um, yeah, she's, uh, I only learned about her last year through, I think she's sort of appeared in about two academic articles. So she's only sort of just, um, just being studied in like a in a literary francophone um, environment, um, but yeah, her her work is um, a, a lot of it engages very strongly with environmental um, environmental movements, climate change resistance, and particularly climate refugee um, sort of solidarity. Um, so. Uh, she has a, a number of um, more performance installation works um, and she's also very active on social media or she gears her um, she gears her artwork to social media in in a way um, for example one of her um, performance works is called hashtag to refugee climat I think um, and so yes a, a lot of work sort of around around climate change action and uh, refugee solidarity and feminist causes, um, particularly. Uh, she's sort of growing, I think, in international um, respect and reception. She's had in the last um, two years or 2019, 2020, she's been um, in a, uh, what's the word, like artist in residence program at um, Atlanta University, Clark Atlanta University in the US. Um, so I think she's sort of coming up in the world now, like in terms of reaching into different spheres of study. But yeah, she's a really exciting artist. Would encourage anyone who'd like to, to check her out. <laughs> Definitely seems that way from what we've seen today. And yeah. <laughs> 
Tishani, would you like to take over? Yeah, no problem. So I think with Sonny Labutonsi, he is very well regarded within the Francophone literature, specifically for those concentrating on sub-Saharan Africa. But I think the biggest problem that has come up, especially when with scholarship tied to him, is that his novel is constantly compared to uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's uh, 100 Years of Solitude, especially in its use of magical realism. And with people trying to figure out if that realism or that sense of um, parallel narratives between like the Pygmies as well as like the Native Americans within Marquez's novel have that parallel or whether there is something that is missing there. And ultimately, I think only recently there has been a sense of um, a desire to like deconstruct what it means as well as you know how gender plays there because it is very prominent, but it is constantly uh, suppressed for you know magical realism, that argument on magical realism was the science fiction, as well as how um, totalitarianism and the concept of totalitarianism as a political theory operates within a novel. So unless you actually unpack the um, actions of the female characters, it is quite difficult, I would say, to see how it comes out, but it does come up very strongly because ultimately there is a connection between all these totalitarian leaders and they're very much birthed um, birthed, I would say, by these two women, and they try to ultimately suppress them as much as they can. Uh, although it uh, it ultimately comes back to them at the end that femininity comes out through all the ashes of the cities that go down in flames because of the masculinized uh, supremacy, as Lidi Murilano calls it. But I would highly encourage you to read it because I think it was called that novel within the 1980s that everyone, uh, you know, the L'Académie Française went in ra like raved about, but I think there has really been a shift in uh, academic concentration now towards like gender politics, as well as like how totalitarianism actually what is working in tandem or in against, or how it operates against that whole feminized um, sense of independence that is coming out and what it means for today's Africa. Because one of the things that Labutonsi does is he, because that period of time when he wrote it, that was when Mobutu Sese Seko was actually in power. So he would have died. I mean, he said he would have put his life on the line for writing and for specifically naming Mobutu, but the editors didn't necessarily allow that to happen. So he has camouflaged, I would say, a lot of the things that have actually happened in Congo within that novel. So there are a lot of very interesting parallels as well as almost um, rejected the way Mobutu has treated women as well. Thank you. Any more questions? Or shall I just exercise my rights <laughs> of my exclusive rights? Right, so I was just maybe going to them. Oh yes, Sky has. I um, I do have a question, but if we don't have time, it's it's quite a specific question, so I can ask. Like shiny later. We have time. Go yeah. Ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much, both. Um, this is a question for Dakshani because I am um, work on Sony Levitonzi as well. Um, it's really nice to get to speak to someone else about it because there aren't that many people working on it. Um, I had a couple of questions. One was maybe about the application of um what you said about the womb to, um the questions of power that come up in Sony's work beyond Africa, because he also says that, um, obviously, like you said, there's there's all the references to Mobutu, but it's also um, a book that's applicable to other situations. Um, so that was one question. And also I wondered um, what you thought of a more kind of pessimistic reading of the book where <clears throat> the, um, the womb becomes the space for um, resistive power to be co-opted through all these rapes and through all the these births of the multiple genre, genre I can't remember what they're all called. <laughs> um, but yeah, the way that the the kind of Marcia line of the family is through marriage and rape um, co-opted by the guide and the soldiers. And so by the end, you don't really know who's the... Um, yeah, who's on the, the kind of the side in power and who's the, the resistive forces. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, thank you so much, Sky, for your question. So I'll start with the first one. Definitely, I will agree with you. Um, Sonila Boutonsi is, you know, because I think he's that Congolese writer. It's almost like, okay, like what is he saying about Mobutu? And I think that comes up first. But you're absolutely right that his um, writing, especially in its ultimate critique of totalitarianism as well as dictatorship, is very much, I would say, um, a larger attack on how a lot of African nations, and I'm looking at the Ivory Coast, as well as like, for instance, Guinea, have operated in their dictatorships, which I've been running, I would say, even until today. And I think one of the interesting things is that um, I think to really look at how he does it is very interesting in the sense that he doesn't necessarily, he creates a fictionalized state. And there is just a lot of, you know, all the big ones, the bestiality, that rape, um, the constant like, plundering of like forest resources. And what is essentially happening here is I think a larger critique on what has happened to Africa post gaining its independence and asking a lot of those questions that I think Akili um, Membe asks in his famous um, post-colonial or decolonial theory actually, in whether Africa has actually gone past its colonialist state or whether it's constantly anchored there because of that rampant dictatorship as well as the fact that politically there are other nations such as the US for instance even until today that continue to affect how dictatorship runs rampant within these African nations because of that financial ties that we see actually come up within the guides and I think that's one of the things that sense of um, pervasive like that that I would call it brazenness within La Boutonsi's work that really um, is a cry out to like the whole world I would say in how in you know stating that Africa cannot necessarily return to a point zero or even attempt to gain its independence unless it addresses that overarching dictatorship that it you know it's very much anchored to that colonialist state that it thinks it has come out of from, but it hasn't necessarily come out. And I think the second one, you are absolutely right in the pessimistic reading. Uh, I think when I read it the first time, I thought that it was extremely pessim pessimistic as well in, in terms of how you know these two women or even the like resistance against these totalitarian leaders were constantly fighting. And all that happened was that you know bombs took place and cities burnt down and then it's ashes and then nothing really happens. It's almost like the ending is like a restart of life, but then there's, this person who looks like as if a dictator is gonna come out of this person. And I think you are also right in that it is very difficult to understand if the women, because of the fact that they have contributed to, you know, because they are birthing or giving birth to these totalitarian leaders, whether they are good or evil. And I think ultimately that's where um, I think the daughter Shadana from that bloodline of, you know, Shadana and Marcel comes to be a little bit different in the sense of that interaction with the forest, because I think until the forest becomes that nation state under science fiction, it is very much an outside territory, outside Katamalanasi and all of the bestiality, sexuality and violence that runs rampant there. And it's that, that organic state that um, is almost like a holding in resistance that isn't necessarily necessarily untapped, but there is a sense that you know, if whether it's a woman, even if that woman you know does come into play within the forest and becomes the forest, is there danger then that that because Shadana is also a part of Katamalanasi, that kind of stains whatever the forest has to offer in a way because of that dual association she has. So I think that's the problem really with Labutonsi's work is that dual association because a character such as her is you know born within that fictionalized state and then ultimately goes into the forest but then comes back to that very same problem because of the men around her and it does provide a pessimistic view of um, whether the womb actually has to it, it, it just has to obliterate itself almost because of all the trouble that has been induced from the children it has given birth to. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions or comments? I was just wondering as well about the um, the sort of the use of traditional maternal uh, images, and this question is in particular to uh, to Josephine. Um, so I was. Um, interested in the idea of sort of using the very essentialist, if you like, and traditional um, uh, imagery of motherhood uh, for sort of subversive uh, purposes a little bit. So I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about that, um, how uh, 
you know, how those images are sort of transformed. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think I think that's what I find so interesting about about this work is that it can definitely be read in multiple ways. And I think my preliminary reading was this sort of expression of grief, um, especially because some of the other image that, images that I didn't really talk about in this presentation are very like, there's a lot of pregnant women in water. There's some like uh, just about to give birth and just having given birth and little babies and stuff, all of which she clearly positions herself as separated from. And there's a clear sense of grief for that like normative maternity um, in the text. But I, I also see these, yeah, really interesting, potentially subversive um, relationships with maternity coming through as well that I've um, tried to gesture to here. And, and that's why I found it so interesting to start looking at the, um, both this like of this naming parallel and the thematic parallels with Condé's work because, because Condé's novel really doesn't present a normative um, relationship to maternity in any sort of central way. The, as, as I explored a little bit, the, the mother, the biological mother, Renette dies in childbirth, and then the care of her child is taken over by these three men in various forms. And then any contact with other maternal relatives of Renette is um, ultimately futile. The, the aunt that, that Renette wanted to take care of her child really doesn't want anything to do with the kid. Um, and it's only these men who really don't have a normative relationship to to maternity or even to any sort of parentage of this child um, that come into play. So I think it was really fascinating seeing that as a potential jumping off point for, for Gabon in a way, potentially. Um, I'm obviously conjecturing here through her, her name choice and the works being um, relatively close in time frame. Um, but yeah, seeing that as a potential basis for this subversive alternative maternities in the film was really interesting. So that's when I started seeing this potential for non-human mothers and for mothers of the non-human, which then links a lot to her climate change activism in sort of a more, um, in what becomes, in, a, in another presentation, I tried to explore this a bit, for, a bit further, this link to climate change and environmental stewardship becomes clearer when you see this video in conjunction with another video she did which she named more explicitly like Condé's On Attendant de Monterezo. So again, a very direct link. And in that On Attendant de Monterezo, she um, very much talks about climate change action and there's a number of artistic installations. So seeing these two present presentations of maternity in conjunction lends itself to, yeah, this, this really interesting use of traditional images of, of maternity and essentialist like links between uh, birth and parentage and stuff. Um, in in this different context which yeah i think it's a really interesting use of use of traditional images for unusual purposes <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah great well um are there any uh, questions or or comments to either or both of the presenters Well, in that case, I think maybe we then will break up and enjoy a little bit longer break before the next uh, uh, panel. Is that okay? Uh, sounds right. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, so I would like to ask everybody to join hands and thank both uh, uh, of our presenters for the really fascinating talks. And we are going to reconvene in uh, exactly 20 minutes, if that's okay. I already have a couple of questions, but we will keep them for the end. Uh, so uh, we, will, we will move on um, to our, our second speaker, uh, Eli uh, Waters, um, who is a first year uh, DPhil candidate at uh, Wadham College, the University of Oxford, 
Uh, in July 2021, uh, she completed an MS uh, in Women's Studies also at Wadden, and she uh, graduated the year before with a BA in Modern and Medieval Languages from the University of Cambridge. And her uh, research background is in French and Francophone studies, uh, with a focus on 20th and 21st century queer and disability literatures. Uh, and today, Ellie is going to uh, talk about water and mental unhealth in Amélie Nothomb's Soif and Marie Dariussec, uh, La Mer à l'envers, which were both published in 2019. Ellie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Caroline. And thank you so much, Dalila, for such, a, such an exciting paper. I'm so excited to discuss it. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, if you can't hear me or my internet goes, just shout because I can move. Um, also, if you hear small, high-pitched screens, I live opposite a school, so that's what that is. But again, I can move. <laughs> okay. Um, can you all see that and hear me? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting on my own ongoing research on the interactions between water and mental distress in 21st century French and Francophone women's fiction. This paper looks specifically at Marie Darius ex La Mer à l'envers and Amélie Nothomb's Soif, two novels that were published a day apart in August 2019. Um, in line with Darius ex and Nothomb's past writing on eating disorders, grief, depression and trauma, I will argue that depictions of distress and non-eating are immersed with the aqueous as narrative attentions turn from plates to landscape in Darius sex text and from hunger to thirst in Nottoms. Um, just some content warnings before I start, this presentation will include discussion of mental illness, particularly eating disorders, as well as mentions of death and drowning. Um, my paper will be roughly 15 minutes long and I'd be more than happy to send over my slides afterwards if you'd prefer not to listen right now. Um, La Mer à l'envers tracks Rose Goyenech, psychiatrist and mother of two, as she embarks on a 10-day cruise across the Mediterranean with her two children. When a migrant boat capsizes close by, Rose witnesses the rescue effort and encounters Eunice, an adolescent from Niger, to whom she gives her son's mobile phone. They part unexpectedly when the refugees are removed from the ship, but remain through the phone within one another's reach. One day, Eunice calls from a refugee camp in Cali, where he lies injured and starving. Rose drives to the north coast to find Juness and settles him into her family home to rest and recuperate. La Mer à l'envers also demonstrates a preoccupation with food, eating, nourishment, bodily form and weight, one which has been explored extensively in secondary literature on Darius sex writing. The theme of non-eating appears in varying degrees of implicit or explicitness throughout Darius sex corpus, her short story Encore là, for, for example, tracks a mother's fixation with losing kilos and cutting calories as she stews in postpartum depression, whilst Darius X's first novel, Truise, has been read by scholars as evoking themes of bulimia and anorexia. In La Mer à l'envers, the food anxiety is subtle, almost subtextual. Protagonist Rose neither seeks nor receives medical attention linked to eating or disorder. Instead, possible symptoms accumulate and appear only, it seems, in between the novel's lines. What I mean by this is, there seems to be an unspoken understanding between narrator and reader that Rose's eating habits are different, perhaps more disordered, than those of her family and entourage. The narrative is interspersed with mealtimes in which Rose's portion is starkly smaller, more modest than that of her fellow diner. Take, for instance, the following all-inclusive breakfast that she shares with her daughter. Pendant qu'elle, and elle is Rose, pendant qu'elle buvait un espresso en grignotant des amandes et des fruits, Emma empilait des croissants et des pancakes et des gaufres et des donuts et du Nutella et du sirop d'érable. The opposing implications of grignoter, to nibble, in this case almonds, and empiler, to stack or hile, pile high of pancakes, reinforce the juxtaposition between Rose's poultry fruit and nut mix and Emma's plate full of sugars and fats. A similar juxtaposition can be found in a fast food order for Rose and Eunice. An hamburger à la micaline, son bacon, une salade pour elle et deux coca light pour elle. The third person narration is soaked with and steered by Rose's stream of consciousness, meaning that the qualifying of what is pour elle and crucially what is not pour elle corresponds to the virtue or goodness she ascribes to choosing a salad over a burger, 
to selecting quote unquote good foods as per a Western pseudo logic of dieting, detox and weight loss or weight control. Um, several times throughout the novel, Rose's subjectivity shifts focus from measly food portions to the expansiveness of the sea. Um, Darius Sek is well known for her water writing, the maritime focus of which becomes crystal clear just from looking at her list of publications. The 1999 prose work, Le Mal de Mer and Précision sur les Vagues, shown here in a publicity poster for their dual publication, precede the 2009 theatre piece, Le Musée de la Mer, and the 2012 hybrid media book, La Mer console toutes les lettres, <clears throat> co published with photographer Gabriel Duplanty. Reading closer into the corpus, her works are based in condensation and precipitation, in rivers and bubbles and ice caps and pleasure pools. But to return to eating and non eating, towards the novel's close, Rose stops at McDonald's for lunch with her children. As it happens, this McDonald's overlooks the sea. And as Rose foregoes a Big Mac, the aqueous takes the place of the elemental in the novel's streams of consciousness. El déjeune sur la terrasse, la terrasse du McDo, et la dor plonge dans l'Atlantique. Le fleuve est d'un cri de zin sur le bleu laiteux de la mer, un paysage bicolore et liquide, l'eau douce qui entre dans l'eau salée. As Rose's attention moves from lunch to landscape, from Répa to Rivière, she fixates on the coalescence of waters instead of the lunch she consumes in its view. Whilst the protagonist fills her mind's eye with water, its colours, patterns, movements and textures, she does not fill her body in this same way. Although the sea is a re reassuring constant, a reliable visual feast for Rose, it is also a source of crisis and distress. Aboard the cruise ship early one morning, Rose witnesses the rescue of migrants from their capsized boats. Il est dans la mer, est-ce un nageur? Est-ce qu'on pouvait nager dans ces positions? Il était mort. Ils étaient en train de repêcher, là, juste au-dessus, le corps d'un homme mort. After seeing the body of a drowned man in the sea, Rose stumbles back to her cabin, her thoughts foggy and mind adrift. She stands motionless be beside her sleeping children, feeling at a loss for what to do. She resolves, une douche, voilà une douche. The ephemeral respite that Rose finds in this immersive encounter with water finds its antithesis in the preceding image of the drowned man, gesturing to a slippery polysemy of water in La Mer à l'envers, at once restorative and irreversibly destructive. As stated in a 2001 interview with François Bunel and Thierry Gondiou, the childhood death of Darius' ex brother by drowning underpins her fiction, which swells with water in all its affective nuances. The author's familial grief saturates the novel, I suggest, with a sea-based existential fear. After drawing on the death of 32 shipwrecked passengers from a liner some years before the diegetic present, the narration taps into Rose's reflections aboard the cruise ship on human smallness and oceanic immensity. Elle visualisa son petit corps debout dans la masse creuse du bateau et la mer dessus, énorme, indifférente. Death, a presence as énorme and indifférente as the Mediterranean, Il infiltrates and complicates Darius X writings, writing of bodies of water, which, all at once in the novel, serve as a distraction from hunger and a reminder of mortality. With this polysemy in mind, I turn to Swa. No Tom's 27th novel to be published since 1992. Swap is a first person retelling of the passion, passion with a capital P, of Jesus Christ. That is specifically from his imprisonment on the Thursday before Good Friday until his resurrection on Easter Sunday. This Christ speaks, however, in an autumn infused voice, which is represented visually on the cover of the Livre de Push, which bears an illustration of Christ inverted and laid over Notom's portrait, as if to signify a laminating or amalgamating of their subjectivities. This amalgamation is clear in the Notombian Christ sermons and soliloquies themselves. He speaks aloofly of his sexuality. He shares a need to faire pipi. He ruminates on maternal love and loss and jokes freely that, for instance, confondre son amoureuse avec sa mère, c'est peu recommandable. Most importantly for this paper, Swerf, as its title suggests, has a strong focus on thirst, specifically extreme thirst, a kind of dehydrated wisdom that the Notambian Christ looks to impart upon the reader. Tentez cette expérience. Après avoir adorablement crevé de soif, ne buvez pas le gobelet d'eau d'un trait. Prenez une seule gorgée, gardez-la en bouche quelques secondes avant de l'avaler. L'amour que, que vous approuvez à cet instant précis pour la gorgée d'eau, c'est Dieu. Here, the Notambian Christ encourages us to delay drinking as long as possible, to delay that first sip of water until we are quote-unquote dying of thirst. 
And rather than gulping down that first sip and the second and so on, the Notumbian Christ asks, to hold, asks us to hold it in our mouths, to wait a little longer before quenching our thirst. It is in this moment, he avows, that the warmth we feel for the mouthful of water is divine. It is God, c'est Dieu. Prolonging thirst is worth it, therefore, for the godly elation we feel at its end. If the first gulp of water is God, it is, more, it is, is, it is also interesting to note that later on in the novel, the Northumbrian Christ professes the following. La mort de Dieu, c'est l'eau qui n'étange jamais. These two quotations, which span the same line of logic, belong to a kind of diegetic formula. Intense thirst plus one mouthful of water equals God. And the love of God is equivalent to limitless mouthfuls of water. Water lies as relief, even reward. Water and the sensations it can elicit, love, joy, and pleasure, are God. Yet the act of depriving oneself of water, something that we famously need in order to survive, in order to survive even more, in fact, than we need food, draws pertinent parallels with other works in Nautom's oeuvre, in which water is stirred into autofiction as a necessary element of distress, unhealth, survival, and sometimes recovery. In, 2004, in her 2004 um, Biographie de la Fin, in which the author tracks her adolescent experience of anorexia, the autofictional Amélie writes, En un monde où tout était compté, où les portions les plus incongrues me semblaient encore procéder d'un rationnement, le seul infini piable était l'eau, robinet ouvert sur la source éternelle. In this quotation, which is emblematic of Biographie de la Fin more broadly, Emily looks to offset rationing, emptiness, and starvation with the vastness and infinitude of water. What she calls her surfin is inextricably linked to her surfsoif. In other words, her extreme thirst derives from and is anchored in extreme hunger. Soif, too, bears um, traces of what Catherine Rogers has described, has described as, quote, an anorexic sensibility which perhaps stems from uh, Notum's own anorexia during her adolescence, end quote. Some way into the novel, the Notumbian Christ mentions a preoccupation with his weight. Je mange le minimum, porte plus que mes 55 kilos, mes souffleraient. And notes how some refuse to hear him due to his maigre, asking themselves, comment attribuer la moindre sagesse à cette échala? So the Notumbian Christ is thin to the extent of being overlooked as a prophet. He is scorned and disdained and compared to a stick, stake or reed. Although the Notumbian Christ is situated between his own aesthetic food discipline and the scornful weight discrimination of others, the main source of his agony, as told in Swift, stems from those final hours of the Passion, capital P, hanging from the cross. This agony wanes, however, for the Notumbian Christ through his devotion to and reverence for thirst. In these final hours, thirst becomes his seul infini fiable. In the midst of his crucifixion, he draws strength from the first mouthful of water sucked from a sponge held up to his mouth by a soldier. C'est la preuve que je suis sauvé. Oui, au degré de douleur où je suis arrivé, je peux encore trouver mon bonheur dans une gorgée d'eau. Ma foi est intacte à ce point. Crucified, with his faith intact, the Notumbian Christ, in this moment, is paradigmatic of Notum's career-long philosophy on distress. Even in the greatest pain, there will be solace. In the, in the Notumbian universe, this solace comes in the form of dry mouths and itchy throats. As the Notumbian Christ, much like Amélie in Biographie de la Fin, waits and waits, then drinks and drinks. It is in this faith that her Christ's couples even magnifies his pain with extreme thirst. Yet, like the for, like, um, unlike the foregoing of food or the extreme hunger of anorexia, which can be oppressive and disabling, the withholding of water brims for the Notumbian Christ with the potential for relief for a godly bliss, joy, sense of wonderment and delight. Pairing bodily, psychic or emotional pain with extreme thirst may not translate as good medical advice beyond the Notumbian world, but it demonstrates, crucially for this paper, the inextricability of distress and remedy and water and thirst in Notum's writing, as in that of Darius Eck, for that matter, as their protagonists walk the shoreline between lack and indulgence, emptiness and immensity, and suffering and reprieve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie um, and Daniela. That, that was both, uh, they were both absolutely fascinating uh, papers. Uh, so I'm going to, to open the, uh, the floor to, to questions uh, already. Um, 
Has anybody got a question for our, our speakers to start with? Okay, I'll, I'll make a start and it will give you a few minutes to, to gather your thoughts. Um, I was really struck by a, you know, the different uh, focus, obviously, Delilah, you focus more on the land and, and Eli, you focus much more on the water. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, the offers in most cases are trying uh, are, are using land and water in both cases to really uh, push what they wanted to, um, to, to do that project uh, as it stands. Um, I'll start maybe with a question with, with Eli there. Uh, I was obviously making the connection with Biographie de la Fin when you were when you were uh, talking uh, about about the, this first and this uh, extreme emphasis on, on person and and the, the potomanie that she's also uh, explaining uh, that she is um, cultivating almost uh, in, in Biographie de la Fin. Um, do we, you know, um, do do we? Do you have an, an idea as to why she placed such as an, an emphasis on swath in uh, in the second uh, in, in the novel in that one the twenty nineteen novel why she moved away maybe from hunger to swath? It's a very broad question, but just if you have an if you have thought about it. My reading is that. Thank you for the question. That's a really great question. Um, my reading is that the swath is a means i don't know whether it's actually i mean all of all of her writing that's talking about anorexia i read is auto fictional so i don't know whether um in talking about thirst she's drawing from her own experience and there's um a scene in biographie de la fin where um she's drinking cups and cups of water and her mum goes ça suffit and she talks about how upsetting it is to be told like that's enough you can't drink any more water um, so I don't know whether that is something that actually happened in her childhood. And so that's where, like, she's always had this affinity with thirst. Um, but I think, having said that, I do actually think that it's not something she's made up. I think it's something that she she genuinely, like, has faith in. Um, when she, uh, she did a, um, she spoke to France Culture and she said that she'd spoken to her nephews and was horrified because they had no interest in thirst and they'd never like they'd never mm -hmm. used thirst as this meditative means of being in the present or you know um like becoming a tube as she talks about in metaphysique de tube as drinking water and then flushing it out and how exciting that is and i think that um the way that i read it is she in in the place of the emptiness of the extreme hunger she fills herself with water because it's filling herself with something um and so in that way it's it's like a cope a means of coping with um with the experience of anorexia both physical and and mental experience um yeah, yeah i don't know if you have any yeah, thoughts no, on no. I, I, I also thought about a uh, dieu and metaphysique the tube obviously when she if i remember well when she says that you know she she felt like that she was god until a certain age and I also thought about, I think it's Petroni, where she's actually, the whole story revolves about, uh, around drinking champagne. Um, so, you know, you, you, there was also already an occurrence in the publication of um, an emphasis on drinking, but not so much water, but not champagne there. And it could be interesting to explore that a, a little bit further, but thank you very much. That was a very uh, nice answer. Um, anybody else has, has a question for, for Eli or Delila? No, I'll, I'll ask you a question then, Delila. Um, I'm not I'm not familiar uh, at all. Oh, I'll, I'll get to you in a second, Egle. Um, I'm not familiar at all with the with the rhizome. Well, well, I'm a bit with the rhizome, but not with um, the work um, of Maestri. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about uh, the correlation between hierarchy and patriarchy um, in, in the work. Yeah, so um, I, I have to say that she doesn't openly talk about patriarchy or hierarchy in her text, but okay. more in her um, interviews, because she believes that the um, author shouldn't influence um, the reader. 
because she wants the reader to create their own meaning and to try to, um, yes, to create their own meaning by reading her text. But yes, yeah, since it's, um, um, it has this rhizomatic um, uh, partial organization and, um, um, and there is no, no, no recit, uh, there is no narrative. Um, mm -hmm. And all the fragments are um, chaotically float on the page. Um, it really reproduces the shape of a rhizome and these attacks our binary and hierarchical vision of the world and therefore it can um, attack um, the fundamental opposition between men and women that is the first opposition that results from the application of the hierarchical tree-like shape image of thought on chaotic matter so it's really the shape and the way she structured she connected all the different fragments that um, act on our mind forcing us to, to see and to read differently and inevitably these affects um, uh, the position between men and women and as a result also the patriarchal vision of society. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. Um, and actually when I when, when listening to you, I was actually thinking of, um, uh, about the, the talk we, we heard yesterday on, on, on Monique Wittig as well and this kind of um, the different shapes on the page and so on and so forth. So that was that was a very nice uh, thing to link back to something we heard yesterday as well. Uh, Igle, uh, you had a question. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of a question this is, but maybe it's just a reflection um, and maybe an invitation to uh, to think. I, I can't help but think about the links between the two panels, in the sense that uh, you know the way imagery of water. Uh, liquid uh, maternity and the, the idea of subversion and how they are used in a different way because the previous panel sort of focused on um, uh, non-French uh, authors who are non-French, non uh, I, I, what do they call them, I don't, coming from the Francophone space and these two novels in this panel are very much French uh, novels. So, and it seems to me, and I don't know what, what you, your thoughts on this is, that um, there is this idea in, in, uh, in France for, for women, in women's writing, that there is this resistance to the uh, conflation of femininity and motherhood and water there is the resistance of like you know we have to rethink this image somehow uh, uh, whereas uh, this imagery is used in a different way in uh, non-french uh, francophone authors work and I wonder whether whether there is something interesting I can't I keep thinking about the sex novel the mile the mile de mer and the idea in that novel of the map of water being uh, of water and the idea of maternity being, being overwhelming and uh, sort of suffocating. Whereas in the previous panel, we saw that the idea of water is actually it's some it's a powerful, it gives power, it gives uh, power of multiplicity and inclusion. So I wondered whether the you know, speakers of both panels maybe had any ideas of this. On this. Thank you so much for that. Oh, go on. <laughs> thank you so. <laughs> thank you so much for that question. I'm so glad you raised that because that's something that I was thinking about as well, especially on this panel, land, water, and gender. And I was thinking about what my interest in gender with these two novels is. Because obviously, they're both women, but have both said that they don't want to be considered as women writers, which is completely if I had published anything, I would also be like, don't do not call me a woman writer. Um, so I was thinking about it and I'm aware of the, um, like the, it seems like a tale as long as time, this idea that water is a feminine element and um, through trying to find secondary work and philosophy on water, I read um, Gaston Bachelard's L'eau et les rêves and, um, there is a really awful passage. I mean, it's given that it was published in 1942, it's like a really great book, 
I say this coming from women's studies and not expecting very much, but it's actually like very interesting and raises some really interesting points. Um, but there's a really awful passage where he's talking about, I mean, the whole book is about the four elements, um, water, air, earth, and fire. And he says that in the material imagination of um, the poet, only two elements can ever come together um, and it, they come together in a marriage. So only two of these four can ever come together. And he says that each of the four elements is either like slightly feminine or slightly masculine. Um, and um, says that if two feminine elements come together, then one of them slightly masculinizes in order to balance it out. Because obviously you can't have two feminine elements in a marriage, that's like disgraceful. Um, so <laughs> he talks about that. And so I was thinking about the associations of femininity with water and how that applied in my work. And in the previous panel, the previous panel was so stunning and it was so, so interesting to see how that come, how um, that association appears outside of France. Um, and I was thinking that if there, if between Notum and Dariusek, I see the association more in Dariusek. But having said that, like for instance, you mentioned Le Mal de Mer, which is all about, um, there's four different protagonists and three of them are the granddaughter, the mother and the, grandma as in like you know three generations um and their, their narrations melt into one another you, there's no like clear point where one begins and one ends and so that lay, lends itself to a reading of the femininity and water but in a recent podcast um with Maison de la Poésie Darius X said and I think she said this before that um her protagonists who tend to be like um white women, French white women in their 40s and 50s tend to be her if she wasn't a writer. So she, I think she puts her, when she writes these novels, the, the main protagonist is her in that situation without the skill or interest in writing. So how she would go about it um, without that, whether it's a means of coping or, um, you know, like analyzing and understanding her life. And so I think it would, you could possibly read the text as essentializing water and um, femininity, but I actually think that she writes about herself and also loves water and loves the sea and loves having grown up in the Basque country, um, has a real um, affinity and relationship with, with um, water in all its forms. So I have, yeah, sorry, that's a really, really long-winded answer, but I have thought about this and think it's it's really interesting. And when I first um, started doing this project, decided that I was completely against essentializing water, whatever is feminine. And I think that I can't quite do that, but yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think that um, it can definitely be read, especially in the Darius Sec texts, if, um, I'm going to stop because I'm rambling, but thank you so much. I don't know if Dalila, you had anything to say. I don't know if anyone from the previous panel uh, want to add anything, uh, anything to that. Josephine, maybe? Yeah, I might just jump in just because, yeah, so my, my sort of whole PhD pro project is about examining this, um, this relationship between water and femininity. In, in the context of um, island spaces, right? So countries surrounded by water and how that might inflect the different ways that the women writers, women artists of my corpus interact with this representation of water and their representation of gender. So interestingly, I started off at kind of the opposite point of like, I know there's this association of water and femininity and I want to see where that goes in a non-French setting because I came in with an, I guess because of Bachelard and some of the other sort of earlier um, like second wave feminist texts where, where they play with elements and maternity in kind of essentialist ways, um, that this association might be a Eurocentric one that I've um, just coming in with and wanted to see where that changes in these different contexts. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it is, I just find water such a rich element to play with because it has all of these so, so many different connotations and then particularly in the two sort of set regions that I'm working with, the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands, um, these sort of specific historical and cultural um, associations with religion and Middle Passage um, and, you know, 
migration over centuries in, in Oceania. Um, and yeah, it's it's just, it's, I don't know. I'm just <laughs> just saying it's such a fascinating thing to work with and it's so interesting to hear um, Ellie and Delilah's presentations. And yeah, have an, um, such an interesting, another take on what water can do and the, what the deprivation of water can do in a text. It's such, a, such an interesting, um, I guess, uh, by bringing the Natomb and Darisek Dariusek text together, you see this like abundance of water as a replacement of food and then the deprivation of water in order to access something higher. It's yeah, it's such an interesting um, parallel. But yeah, just just <laughs> that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there's a quick comment from a from Michelle in Michelle Bechel in the in the in the chat uh, for a non-francophone novel about father and motherhood and water Edwige Danticar's Claire of the Sea Light may be interesting uh, so that might be another reference to look into but uh, Alex you have your you have your, you've had your, your hand up for a wee while um, do you want to ask your question thank you um yes a question for Ali um, that kind of follows on from the last discussion concerning deprivation. And my question really is about immersion, um, to, considering not, um, so we have anorexia or the restriction of food or water, uh, and especially water being, um, being that which allows for bodily immersions um, to the point of effacement. Um, so these are refused in favor of immersion in an experience of the divine or, or ex an experience of bliss that can only occur at the point of utter deprivation, which is the opposite of immersion. And I've just wondered, what does that mean about immersion or to be a part of an immersive experience? And does that mean that um, immersion is, it has two different to at least different um, aspects to it, one spiritual, one bodily? Um, I just wondered about the, the play of these mutually exclusive opposites and the subject of emotion, really. And I wondered if, if that had been something you thought about, because it just interests me, it strikes me as very interesting. That's such a fascinating question. Thank you so much. Um, yes. I, having, when thinking about immersion with the Notom, especially in, um, I think it is in Metaphysique de Tube, she talks about having grown up in Japan that her name in French means rain. Um, and there's there's a phrase, and I'm gonna completely butcher it, but it's something like Amélie et l'eau, l'eau et Amélie. So she very much plays with this, like having porous boundaries between her and water. Um, and then the novel ends with her um, attempting suicide in a pond. So it's kind of like she loves water and she is water, but also like it is the death of her. Um, so yeah, the the um, the extremes are fascinating. And I, I thought through writing this paper, I was going to reconcile them, but found myself like even further apart than I was when I started. Um, so immersion, I think, comes from the fact that water really is part of um, Notom's identity and in Swerf she describes it as, um, she describes, no she describes Swerf, she describes thirst as um, mon identité véritable, so it's really part of her um, and in La Mer à l'envers there's a scene in which um, Rose is on the cruise ship in the swimming pool and is talking about how her being in this body of water upon another body of water is kind of like a bubble and a glass and there's a real fascination for how water works and how it feels and um so it's also like quite playful as well as grappling with those, these ideas of life and death and um I think both are full of a real joy for being with or near or in water and I don't know whether that comes from um, I think for a lot of people, this joy for the beach and the seaside comes maybe from like the nostalgia of holidays and vacation, which is like literally vacating the life you live in order to not be there anymore and do something else and rest and recuperate. Um, and I think also there's something to do with meditation as well and being in the present and enjoying what is available right now, which is obviously um, linked to 
um, dealing with mental illness and distress and things like that. So I think there's so much to do with immersion, whether like physical immersion or sort of reading the world through the lens of water. So there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> Thank you so much. Actually, adding to that, I'm thinking really about a immersion in the case of Nutong. So the, the drinking, the taking in water seems to be positive in the Sandra, but the immersion seems to be a much more negative uh, experience for Nutong. If you're thinking about Les Mains de la Mer um, in Biographie de la Fin, or I think the drowning experience in Métaphysique des Tubes. So it seems to be like being in the water immersed is more problematic as opposed maybe to the drinking a lot and taking a lot of um, champagne or, or water there, uh, which is something that might be interesting to reflect upon. Just, just a comment there. That's so true as well with um, In Biographie de la Fin is where she is assaulted. She's assaulted in the sea in Bangladesh, isn't she? So yeah, maybe yes. that, that is true and that's how, yeah, that's a very, very good point. Thank you. Yeah, so this association is kind of because she loves to. She, she said in Biographie de la France, she loves to swim, she loves to be in the sea, but after that, she can't go, so she can't be immersed in a sense. But still, she's still obsessed with this kind of taking in of, of water. Um, there, um, a quick comment from uh, Diana as well in, uh, in the chat about another recent novel in English, The Mermaid of a Black Conch by Monique Ruff. Rofri, Rofi, sorry, uh, which could be interesting, yeah. Uh, and Michelle, you have, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going back to Josephine. Uh, I, was, I wanted to know if, uh, if, if you know of any artists, <clears throat> authors that uh, would deal with the, um, what is it called, Claudicon? Um, you know, that toxic Claudicon, right? Uh, that um, causes prostate cancers? that was used for decades in Guadeloupe and Martinique? I don't, I, ha or I, haven't, yet. I haven't come across anything, um, any okay. texts that deal with that specifically, but I'll definitely have a look with it. That's, it's because it has gone into the, the waters, it, it has polluted the waters. Yeah, that's a great point. I haven't looked at pollution around Guadeloupe and stuff yet, so I'll definitely have a look into it. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> pollution being an interesting word too. True, yeah. <laughs> Any further questions for uh, our speakers? We've got a couple more minutes before closing. Yeah, really? On your own. Um, this is just a quick question for Dalila. Um, I was thinking in your paper about sand sculptures, and I don't know if that counts as a land text, but I was thinking about whether, if it does count as a land text, and then also, um, whether land texts tend to have this like ephemeral quality where for instance sand sculptures will eventually be washed away by the sea and whether that in itself is an anti-capitalist strategy. So yes, uh, it is like ephemeral because uh, um, as um, um, Benina Maitri explains, um, um, it, the land text is um, text in constant motion so you can move the different fragments in your mind so it doesn't have a fixed shape and it can be it can take infinite different shapes every time that you try to to read it that, i don't know if i answered your question <laughs> yeah, because you can, and also you can also start from any point especially on vie de rien because a page are not numbered so it's easier and also her text um can be considered as single rhizomatic machines, as single rhizomes, but also as the components of a bigger machine, of a bigger rhizomes, because there are many references and allusions um, between them. So you can even read them all together and make your own connections amongst the fragments uh, printed in the different books. Delila, actually, as a follow-up question on that, um, is there um, a lot of references to nature and elements like water and 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 la terre and earth in the land art, in the land text of of, um, of Maestri, or is it just a, a parallel she's drawing with the land art 
and then she the content it doesn't necessarily link back to to the natural element that is actually central to to land art uh, there are um, many references to space but in very general terms she talks about she there are many fragments talking about um Lispas, but she doesn't mm -hmm. really define what exactly so because it's also it's all very shady because she doesn't want to influence so you can then interpret them as you wish okay. thank you very much uh we just have two minutes to go so um i'll just i'll just see if there's any more any any other questions before uh we close this session no okay well uh in that case uh, i suppose we're gonna we're gonna draw the question to a close that was a, another fascinating um I was going to say morning because I'm in the UK, uh, but let's say it was another fascinating, fascinating session altogether, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, so we are starting again. I believe this is the last session for today. Uh, we are starting again tomorrow, so at 10 a.m. UK time, 9 p.m. Australian time, and 5 a.m. for early risers uh, in the US. Uh, for a keynote uh, talk by uh, Diana Holmes, which I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, thanks again for all uh, to all the speakers this morning and also in this last session uh, to Delila and Eli for uh, fascinating talks. Uh, and uh, very much, thank you very much for everyone for attending and also for contributing and asking questions. Thank you. Um, Francois, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add before we are closing the session. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I think you you gave a, a very lovely close um, to today's proceedings. So I'll just uh, thank uh, you, uh, Caroline and Edley, as well um, for your work in sharing the panels. And uh, thank you to all the participants um, and the audience today as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow and have a great day. <laughs>